What is the most difficult way to play Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne? If you ask me, it's a solo hard TDE challenge. In this run, you play on hard mode and the goal is to obtain the true demon ending without using any demon in combat, meaning that you can only use the main character Demifiend. Typically, when challenge runners attempt this run, they are doing it in New Game Plus. This is because it's possible to obtain another press turn icon for the Demifiend, allowing you to have two press turns instead of just one. But for a self-proclaimed masochist like me, this wasn't enough, so I decided to make it even harder. On top of playing on hard mode and playing without using demons, I'm going to do this on the New Game save file. This prevents me from getting the extra press turn icon, which means that I will only have one press turn for the entirety of the game. Also, I'm playing on the PC version and I will be using the graphics configurator mod made by Vivi. This mod allows the game to run at 60 FPS instead of 30 and it's great. I spent 573 hours working on this run, suffering losses after losses until I almost lost any hope I had of ever completing it. The video you're about to see now is the journey I went through. This is the story of how I managed to beat the hardest challenge Nocturne has to offer, the hardcore solo TDE run. After reaching Yoyogi Koen, I started talking with the station staff and apparently there's a new animated series airing right now. The show is Raid Call of the Arbiter and it's made by today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. For the first time ever, Raid is getting a limited animated series which is fleshing out its characters and the world of Teleria. Episode 1 is all about the champion Galak and I gotta say, I really enjoyed how they portrayed his character. Before, there wasn't much to say about him, but now he actually feels like a person with emotions. Just by watching, I can tell that he is a warrior with empathy who is involved in a war he clearly doesn't want to partake in. This is something that I didn't expect to get from Raid and I'm definitely looking forward to what the episodes will do with the other champions. Right now you can watch the first episode of Raid Call of the Arbiter for free inside the game and new episodes will come out every Thursday at 10am EST until July the 20th. And to celebrate this moment, Raid is adding a lot of new in-game events as well as features related to the Call of the Arbiter series like being able to read the lore of the champions. Fingers crossed, Death Knight makes an appearance in the show because that dude is easily my favorite character. If this guy was in Shin Megami Tensei, you can bet he would be part of the fiends. Don't get me wrong, Galact is cool and all, but this guy right here? Now this is a real champion. Speaking of champions, brand new characters from the show will come to the game and it will be possible to get them. Everyone will get the chance to obtain Artak, who is one of the five new characters from the show as a playable legendary champion for free simply by logging into Raid for 7 days between now and July the 24th. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, use my link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to get a free starter pack with useful loot as well as this badass looking knight. Special thanks to Raid for sponsoring this video and I better see Death Knight in the animated series. Or else? Before the run even starts, I have to choose which version of the game I will play between Maniacs and Chronicle. In Maniacs you meet El Dante, El Exterminador de Demonios. While in Chronicle it will be not Dante. Oh, um, sorry, I meant Raido Kuzunoa. Yare, yare the version you chose really doesn't change much, so I went with Chronicle. Or so I thought. What I didn't know at the time is that this one choice would have dire consequences later down the road. After listening to some cryptic dialogue, I pick the most shameless name I can think of and I go to the Shinjuku Medical Center to meet my friends, Isamu and Shiaki. Oh, and I'm using the word friends very loosely here. Remember, this is a Shin Meguro Tansei game. It's only a matter of time before they start devolving into walking talking ideologies. I almost get killed by Vegeta and his malnourished goat, but fortunately, the teacher comes in to save the day. And then the world ends. But I'm in luck, because I found this kid called Lucy. He promised to save me if I signed this shady looking contract. I think it has something to do with destroying a disco ball or something. Eh, I didn't read the fine print, but it's okay, no one does. I then wake up in the hospital and it's time to go through the tutorial section of the game. Oh, okay, so this is the first fight. So this is just a tutorial. Uh, wait, wait, what? Uh. Why do they attack before me, bruh? Huh? Oh, 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 kill it. Ah, kill it now. Oh my God. Oh, 
Okay, I think that's the exit. Oh my god, Nocturne, please! Die! What? It dodged! Ah! What? Okay. Ooh. Oh! <laughs> oh! I need one more time. Don't don't crit. He crit again. He crit again. <laughs> Okay. Die. There you go. That's what you deserve. Oh, finally. After surviving the tutorial, I make my way to the second floor and it's finally time to recruit Pixie. Pixie is precious and she must be protected at all costs. Now we can face the first mini boss fight of the run. In this fight, you are outnumbered and these stupid purple goblins are really good at critting you with Feral Claw. Thanks to my healing items and a lot of punches, I managed to beat them on my first try. But then, as I was going back to the save point, I got ambushed by two Kodamas and, and guess what? They killed me! They killed me before I could save, so I had to redo the Preta fight again and again and again. Ugh, okay, I've been putting this off for far too long. We need to talk about random encounters. Oh my god, random encounters in this challenge are broken. Every single enemy deals a ridiculous amount of damage, but wait, it gets worse. On hard mode, it's impossible to run away from a random encounter, so every time I get pulled into one, I am forced to fight for my life and win at all costs or die. This basically means that every random encounter I get locked in turns into a boss fight. You see this thing down there? You might think that it's a compass or a minimap, but <laughs> <laughs> Wrong! This is a panic meter. If it turns red, it means that you are about to get jumped and bodied by the demons. When I started this challenge, I was happy, full of energy and ready to take on the world. But now, I am scared and fearing for my life because of this thing. When it goes from yellow to orange, my anxiety starts rising. And once it turns red, I start sweating profusely. You know, I was under the impression that Nocturne was just a turn-based JRPG, but that's not accurate. No, Nocturne is a survival horror game where you are being stalked by creatures you cannot see until it's too late. Seriously, I know I'm being dramatic right now, but these fights are no joke. While grinding, I had to save after every single encounter because I could lose my progress at any moment. Fortunately for me, in the room next to the save point, there is a spirit who will heal you for free every time. Ah, the joys of free healthcare. After struggling for hours, I managed to reach level 8, and it was time to challenge Fornius. You trying to get by without paying respect to me? The almighty Fornius? Time to die! Fornius mostly goes for ice spells like Bufu, with some physical attacks here and there. It's weak to elect, but I don't have access to any spell that I can use to exploit that weakness right now, so the strat is to spam lunge. Normally, this should be a pretty straightforward encounter, but uh, there is a problem. Healing items. Fornius hits hard, but so long as you have enough healing, you will prevail. The thing is, I only have two medicines and one bead. If I run out, it's a guaranteed game over, and I really didn't feel like farming enemies and hoping they drop something, so I did the one thing I'm good at. Bashing my skull against the wall until it breaks. Which led to me dying again, and again, and again, but eventually, on my 18th attempt, with my final launch, I broke Fornius. Woo, that was close. With this victory, I obtained the Magatama Wadatsumi and I can get out of the mental asylum, but first, I'm gonna run as fast as I can to the save point. For the love of God, Nocturne, let me save my progress, please! Oh, oh, I made it. Um, <clears throat> anyways, um, it, it's time to get out and explore the Vortex world. I can go to Shibuya directly, but first I'm gonna take a detour and get to Yoyogi Park. This shouldn't take too long. Ah, uh, we are finally inside the park. So Pixie's reason for teaming up with us was to reach Yoyogi. 
Once that's done, you will get the option to either let her go or keep her with you. If you let her go, you can obtain the Magatama early, but I'm contractually obligated to let you know that the best option is to refuse and keep her around. Since it's possible to obtain the same Magatama a bit later into the run, I decided to keep my dear Pixie with me. After that, I grabbed the loot and made my way towards the next city. Die. Uh, okay, we are now in Shibuya. This part of the city has a bunch of facilities that you can access, like the Lady of the Fountain, who heals you, and the shop where I can purchase items. You can buy two really useful Magatamas here and wait, 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 Bruh, huh? What is up with these prices? This is another quirk of hard mode. For whatever reason, hard mode triples the store prices. Normally, buying these two Magatamas should cost me 5,000 maka, but since this is Nocturne and hard mode, I'm gonna have to find 15,000 maka somehow. Oh, speaking of maka, you remember how there were spirits who would heal you for free in the medical center? Well, I went back there to grind, and it turns out that as soon as you unlock the Lady of the Fountain, these spirits will refuse to heal you. Yep, that's right, capitalism never dies. So, back to Shibuya. I just need to get to the club, talk to Shiaki, and get back to the safe point. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> Wrong! You hear that music? Yup, it's random encounter time! In order to get to the club, you have to go through a gauntlet of random encounters, and this sucks so much! But hold on, that's not all! Even after you make it to the club, it's not over yet, now you have to get back to the safe room to save your progress! This isn't Pokémon, you can't use teleport to go back to the Pokémon Center! There are no escape ropes to get you out of the dungeon safely! This is Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, so now you have to walk all the way back to the room and god forbid, if you die to one of these ridiculous random encounters that you cannot run away from, you will have to redo this all over again. <laughs> this game makes walking from point A to point B terrifying. I died like 9 times while doing this and it's only on my 10th attempt that I managed to reach the safe room. Uh, I... I really didn't know what I was getting into when I started this run. I have an idea. You satisfy me, and I'll tell you the name. Think you can scratch me in just the right spot? Well. After reaching level 12, I went back to Shibuya and accepted Hichiri's offer. Alright, it's finally time to go to Gin's... Wait, wh why am I here? Yeah, something went wrong and now I'm stuck inside one of the worst segments in the game, the Amala Network. The enemies here are really beefy for no reason and this makes the simple task of moving forward a struggle. 15 billion deaths later, I'm finally near the exit but of course, Noctin won't let me get away without a boss fight. This is Spectre and it's a pretty difficult fight. Right from the get-go, Spectre will summon 5 copies of itself and now it's a 6 vs 1. As you can probably tell, my first attempt did not go very well. One of the most difficult moves to deal with in this fight is Fire Breath. It deals a lot of damage, and the Spectres really love spamming it. Now, there's actually a way to deal with this. The Shiranui Magatama has an innate fire immunity, which is exactly what I need, but... <laughs> Since I didn't buy the Magatama, I would need to go back to Shibuya to get it, but here's the thing. Once you enter inside the metaverse, there is no way to get out unless you beat the boss. So basically, I just softlocked myself. No need to worry though, because I have a plan. Since I knew that Nocturne was, you know, a fair and balanced game, I had the foresight to keep multiple save files at various points. I have a save file right before jumping into the Facebook metaverse, so I can load that up and prepare accordingly before I jump back in. I did some more grinding and got enough money to purchase Shiranui and Iomante. I learned Tarunda and Sukunda from Iomante, and after reaching level 15, I also got Fire Breath from Shiranui. With that done, I can equip Shiranui and jump back into the network to challenge Spectre. This time, it's actually going pretty well. Thanks to Sukunda, I can decrease the accuracy of Spectres, which makes their basic attack more likely to miss. After taking out one of them, the five remaining Spectres fuse into a big Chungus. From there, it's just a matter of feeling and using Lunge until Spectre goes down. Alright, we are in Ginza for real this time. Here you can find Rag's Jewelry. In this shop, you can exchange gems for really useful items that you cannot buy anywhere else. I can't get most of the stuff here at the moment, but it will definitely come in handy later. Oh yeah, in the lounge, you can also find Loki who is feeding his alcohol addiction. We can't go inside his room right now, but don't worry. We will get in there in due time. 
You know, the one thing I've been enjoying a lot so far is Demi Finn's basic attack animation. He just, he just slides there and punches demons in the face. I love it. Atlas truly peaked when they made this move, and I don't think we will ever get an animation that's as good as this one. Hey, you wanna see something cool? After punching my way out of Ginza, I try to enter inside the Nihilo nightclub, but the bouncer doesn't want to let me in because I'm not wearing a shirt, hmm? Luckily for me, there's another way to get there. I just need to cross this bridge and- Dead. As soon as we get past the- Oh my god, Nocturne, please! Okay, so like I was saying, beyond the bridge, you will find the Harumi warehouse. I flip the switch, climb down the ladder, and just like that, I'm in the great underpass of Ginza. Now I just need to make some progress before I get interrupted by a random <laughs> I was able to reach the lower level where the mannequins live. These guys are easily the best part of Nocturne for me. You know that thing they do, the twitching and all? I really like that. There's also a junk shop in here and that's where we meet this guy. Look at that smile. Oh. I try to get out of here, but this dude doesn't want to let me pass. Luckily for me, there is a solution. This guy is a collector mannequin and he's willing to help me if I bring him back a bill. And wouldn't you know it, the bill can be found inside Loki's room. I grab the bill, make my way out, but it looks like I won't be able to leave until I beat the troll. This fight is a bit of a slog, but having Wadatsumi equipped to null ice helps a lot. Alright, now I just need to get back to Ginza and save before. <laughs> Great! Now I have to redo this again! <laughs> Instead of going back to Ginza, I'm gonna use this opportunity to level up. This specific spot in the underpass is amazing. It's close to a safe point, and in the water you are guaranteed to fight Isoras who are weak to fire. I did that for a couple of hours until I finally reached level 20, and with Marugaref equipped, I had finally reached the requirement to learn counter. That grinding session also gave me a lot of maca, and I was able to purchase one of the most important maca tamas for the early game. Kamudo has a physical resistance, and that decreases the damage of physical attacks by 50%. After my purchase, I went to level 21, learned Fog Breath, grabbed the bill, and destroyed the troll. I gave the 1000 yen bill to the collector mannequin, and thanks to his help, I was finally able to move forward. Now I just need to get out of the- The flames of the menorah beckon me to the battlefield! Huh? Yeah. Oh boy, here we go. It's time to fight the first member of the fiends, El Matador. Matador is the first major roadblock of Nocturne, and if you didn't learn your lesson about buffs and debuffs, you are going to have a bad time. At the start of the fight, Matador will always use Red Capote and then attack you. Red Capote raises Matador's evasion and accuracy to the max at plus 4. This means that he is not going to miss you, and if you don't remove those buffs, you won't be able to hit him. Thankfully, at this stage, you can get the Kaja Stones at Rag's Jewelry, and these items remove all buffs. Sounds like a pretty good solution to deal with Red Capote, right? No! You see, Matador's AI is coded to reapply Red Capote if you use the Kaja, so that won't work. You could use Fog Breath to decrease his evasion, but Matador can just use the move again to undo your debuffs. Oh, by the way, this guy has no weakness, so I can't get any press turn unless I crit, and I'm definitely not gonna be able to crit this guy. Debuffing doesn't work, and hitting him also doesn't work. So you might be wondering, how the hell do you deal with this guy? Well, I'm glad you asked, because there is one specific skill that's perfect for this fight. It's counter! So the way counter works is that when you get hit by your physical attack, you have a 50% chance to do a counter attack right away. Now, what truly really makes this skill amazing is that counter has a unique quirk. When activated, it will always land. This skill completely disregards accuracy, which means that I don't have to worry about Red Capote anymore. Counter is great, but right now, it's not dealing enough damage. Surviving isn't too hard at first, but once phase 2 starts, it gets really bad. Matador will start using Andalusia, which hits you 4 times, and he can also use Focus to increase his damage output even higher. I tried as hard as I could, but I wasn't able to survive long enough. Counter was definitely the right skill for this fight, but I was missing something else. Another skill that, when paired with counter, truly elevates it. That skill is Focus. Focus boosts the damage of your next physical attack by 2.5, and in Nocturne, this skill affects counter. Thanks to that discovery, we finally have a strike. I'm never going to attack Matador directly. 
This is great because it allows me to use healing items and focus solely on defense while still being able to deal damage. It came down to the wire, but fortunately for me, the RNG god was on my side and on my 10th attempt, I was able to beat Matador. I use this opportunity to purchase the Magatama Ifumi, which grants me an immunity to force. The main reason I wanted this Magatama is because it allows you to learn one of the best skills in the entire game, Warcry. Similarly to how Fog Breath drops your opponent's evasion and accuracy by two stages, Warcry lets you debuff their physical attack and magic by two. This skill is amazing and I will never get rid of it. I also did some grinding to get my hands on more healing items and as I was doing that, I realized something. See, as soon as you reach the junk shop in the underpass, you can start abusing the lucky ticket system. Every time you spend 1000 maca or more at the junk shop, before leaving, the mannequin will award you a lucky ticket. Once you have 10 of these, you can claim a reward from one of these three boxes. Each box has a set amount of very useful prizes. For example, you can get beads from the black box. Now, this is where things get interesting. The reward you get from these boxes isn't set in stone. It's randomized every time you load into the game. This means that once I get 9 tickets, I can save my game, go in the shop, spend enough money to get my 10th ticket, and then I can pick a box. If I don't get the prize I'm looking for, I can just reload my save and repeat the process until I get what I want. This is huge because the majority of these prizes cannot be obtained easily. As long as I have money and I'm willing to reset, I am guaranteed to get what I want. Alright, we are back in Ikebukuro, which is the home of the Mantra, one of the factions fighting for control over the Vortex world. I go inside the Mantra's HQ and it looks like I arrived just in time to watch one of my favorite cutscenes. Our teacher, she's... <laughs> <laughs> I love this. <laughs> ah, that was fun. But sadly, after Isamu got bodied, I got abducted by the local demons and now I have to survive a trial by combat. So in order to prevail, you need to win three fights in a row against Orphrus, Yakshini, and Thor. Here is what you have to do. For Orphrus, you equip Shiranui, block the fire attacks, and profit. For Yakshini, you equip Ifumi, block the force attacks, and profit. And lastly for Thor, you equip... Uh... Uh... Oh boy. Thor is extremely rough. Just like Matador, he has two press turns, and most importantly, he has no weakness. He can use his basic attack if he feels like it, but 90% of the time he is going to spam powerful elect spells. Now you might be thinking, hey, why don't you equip a Magatama to nullify elect? Well, you see, I would do it if I could, but guess what? The first elect null Magatama you get is after bidding four. You know, the one fight where you would love to nullify elect. Did I mention how much I love this game? I, I really enjoy this game. I'm having so much fun. The best thing I can do is equipping Kamudo to reduce the damage of his physical attacks. Warcry is your only way to decrease force damage and it's a must. Fog Breath is also really good because it can allow you to dodge crucial attacks. As long as you have your debuffs up, the fight becomes more manageable until he pulls out the Kunda. Then you're screwed. At that stage of the fight, Thor is going to use Diodyne and destroy you before you have time to debuff him again. Now the thing with Thor is that while he has the Kunda, it doesn't mean that he's guaranteed to use it. Sometimes he can just forget about it and that is what you want to see. On my 15th try, I got good counter procs and he didn't go for the Kunda. Everything was going well, but eventually I had no beads left. I was so close, but alas, without any way to fully heal myself, there was nothing else I could do. Yo, let's go! Come on, come on, miss. Miss again. Yo, yo, double miss. Let's go! <laughs> Ooh, this was a nightmare. With this victory, I can fully explore the Mantra's HQ and wait. Huh? Ay 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 ay. Right after the absolute wall that I was for, we have to win yet another difficult boss fight. But before we go even further, I have a question for you. What do you think is Raido's weakness? Ding 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 ding! Yup! Raido is yet another boss with no weakness to exploit. 
Fortunately for me, the majority of his moves are physical attacks, so I get to use my counter. There is an issue, however. Raido hits extremely hard with his Enter Yoshitsune, which has a really high chance to crit. And remember, critical hits work the same way as hitting a weakness, so he can just get free additional press turn from that move alone. Now, when I saw this, my first thought was to debuff him with Warcry, but mm, no, 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 we can't have nice things in this game. Whenever Raido detects a debuff, he will immediately remove it with Raptor Guardian. Kamudo is once again the Magatama of choice for this one, but not being able to debuff this guy makes the fight really stupid. Oh, and that's not the only thing you have to worry about. For his neutral special, he wields a gun. The strat here is to use focus whenever you can and pray that counter activates. This can get you pretty far, but once you deal enough damage to trigger the phase shift, it gets worse. At that point, Raido will start using Provoke. This move decreases your defense and buffs your attack by two stages when used. This is when you need to end the fight ASAP, which should be doable if it wasn't for this move. Another one. Another one. And another one. I got filtered so many times until I finally stopped getting panicked and Demifin landed enough counters to get me out of this mess. In the basement of the building, you can find Isamu who is trapped in one of the cells. Hmm, you know what? Maybe I should save him. That's our teacher, man. On second thought, never mind, no, nope, he can stay in there. Alright, we are finally here. I just need to take these stairs and I should be able to... At the very top of the mantra, I meet Gozu Tenno and he rewards me by unlocking two additional demon slots. Uh, wow, how useful. I am Gozu Tenno. Uh, yeah, I know. I am Gozu Tenno. Yes, yeah, you said that already, bro. We are done with the mantra and now I have to sneak into the Nihilo's nightclub. Uh, the assembly of Nihilo. Uh, there are so many things that I could say about this dungeon. <laughs> oh, and just to illustrate how stupid this place is, let me tell you about the Eligor boss fight. This guy always summons two this and these demons are going to spam stone gaze. If this move rocks, you get turned into a stone, and when you are playing solo, this is an instant game over! So another at any one. point into the fight, you another can die one. because of stone gaze, but and wait! It gets better! On top of that, Eligor can also one-shot you whenever he feels like it by spamming Mudo. I'm not gonna lie, this entire dungeon made me mauled really hard, but for what it's worth, I got a good amount of beats out of it. I finally managed to reach Vegeta, but he's too much of a coward to fight me directly, so now I have to deal with one of his goons. Jose from the furry clan. Wait, is is that what, what is this thing? Is he is Jose wearing a diaper? What is wrong with you? The first thing I did for this fight was checking what Jose was weak to, but uh Say the line. <sighs> this boss has no weakness. Yeah! Now for this fight, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that Oze only has physical attacks, and that's amazing because I have counter. The bad news is, <laughs> well, everything else about the fight. Oze has both the Kaja and the Kunda. If he detects buffs or debuffs, he's very likely to remove them, so I can't rely on Warcry to reduce damage. And to make matters worse, he can use Focus to drastically increase the damage of his physical attacks. After getting clocked by this guy over and over, I did notice something. While Oze can remove your debuffs, there are instances where he will prioritize using some moves over the Kunda. For example, if you use Warcry on turn 1, he will immediately use the Kunda, but if you wait and use it on turn 2, he is less likely to go for it. And what's great is that he won't remove that debuff right away, so you can keep him at minus 2 attack for a good amount of turns. With the fight figured out, I did what I had been doing this entire time since Matador, putting my faith in the almighty counter. It took a couple of tries, but eventually my prayers were answered, and with a focus boosted counter, I was able to defeat Oze and I got the Magatama Anathema. The job is done, but just before I could get rid of the Nihilo bros, it looks like they were able to nuke the mantra. Gozu Tenno got bodied and a new path is accessible, but there is one thing I wanna do before leaving this place. On the east side of Ikebukuro resides one of the fiends I have to take care of. Let's see how it goes. I have seen your search history, Demi Fiend. Did you think you were safe because you used incognito mode? Your employer and your service provider can see everything you browse. 
fret not, demi fiend, for I can cleanse your soul from the filth of Tumblr. Now, it's time for your salvation. Receive my cum. Wait, did he just say receive my cum? No, 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 nope, I am not dealing with this, no, I'm out, I'm out! With the mantra in shambles, I can leave the CD from this door and make my way towards the Kabukicho prison, but as soon as I get on the highway to hell, the game sends another boss my way. This guy is Hellbiker, and for the most part, it's a manageable fight. Sure, he has no weakness and hates hard, but as long as I have my debuffs, I should be fine. You're the first one to ever keep up with me! But can you keep up with this? Oh no! Never mind, it's gonna be one of those fights, huh? So the thing with Nicolas Cage is that he is easy, until he isn't. Once you reach phase 2, he gets access to Hell Throttle, and that move grants him 3 additional press turn icons, so now he has 4 press turns that he can use to destroy you. After getting run over by Nicolas 4 times in a row, I decided to tweak a couple of things. He has 3 damage types, physical, fire, and force, so I think my best bet is to make sure I resist all of them. Kamudo takes care of the physical resistance, so I grinded a bit to learn anti-force from Ifumi and anti-fire from Shiranui, and this proved to be exactly what I needed. I was able to survive the onslaught and then I ended the fight with a counter. More random encounter BS later, I'm finally inside the Kabukicho prison. The first time I played through this game, I got stuck here for like hours. It's definitely a confusing dungeon, but this place is fine in my book because you get to rescue the mannequins. After rescuing the twitchy fellas, I got destroyed backwards and forwards until Nocturne decided that I was allowed to reach the last checkpoints to save my progress. The time has come to save the mannequins, and in order to do that, I need to defeat the guardian of the prison. And this guy is kinda lame because it's just an oversized version of the Mizuchi we saw inside the dungeon. But this fight has one redeeming quality. Mizuchi is one of the few bosses in this game with a weakness to exploit. Shocking, I know. This boss has two things you need to worry about. Powerful ice spells and mirage. Mirage can be annoying because it inflicts panic, but it's actually not that bad to deal with here. Now the ice spells on the other end? Yeah, you really don't want to get hit by that. Fortunately, you can just equip Wadatsumi to block ice, and that shuts down 90% of this boss's moveset. With a combination of focus boosted attacks and fire breath, the snake goes down and as a reward, I obtain the Magatama Miasma. With Mizuchi defeated, the mannequins are finally free, and that also goes for their leader. The absolute Giga Chad Futomimi. My name is Futomimi. You may know it already, but I can see into the near future. Together we will find a way to live without suffering. Let me prophesy your future as a token of my gratitude. This guy is easily my favorite character in the game. Oh, by the way, look who also got captured. What are you pissed off for? It's obvious I can't count on you or our teacher anymore. I swear to God, if you say the word teacher one more time. Oh, oh, it's gone. Well, that works for me. In Ginza, I meet with Ijiri, and my new goal is to reach the town of Asakusa, which just so happens to be the place where the mannequins went. In order to reach Asakusa, I need to go through the subway station and explore the Ikebukuro tunnel, and oh my god, this tunnel is a nightmare to get through because of the random encounters. The enemy variety here is really high, and there is no way to cover for everything, so you have to compromise. I decided to kick a Mudo because the physical resistance is generally better to have, but that Magatama gives you a weakness to every single ailment. So if the enemies have a status move, they can easily stunlock you until the end of time. Oh, also, you got these dudes. These random ass demons who can use Dragon Eye to grant themselves 4 press turns. Yes, Dragon Eye, the move that's usually reserved to bosses. Getting out of this hellhole took me 2 hours and 22 minutes. Yes, 2 hours, I counted. For the love of God, knock and please! But hey, eventually I did manage to get out and reach Asakusa. I'm pretty sure that the store here sells really good Magatamas. Let me check how much they- <laughs> Yeah, the two Magatamas I need to purchase are extremely expensive. Just like in real life, I'm also broke inside the game. So on top of being a turn-based survival horror GRPG, Nocturne is also a real-life simulator. I know things don't look too great right now, but don't worry. I have a plan to earn a lot of cash quickly. 
Oh yeah, you know what also happened in the tunnels? During a fight, I got confused by a Mothman. While confused, Demifin started talking to the Mothman and this is what the demon had to say. A challenge, eh? Die. <laughs> my, my head canon is that Demi Fiend was talking about a no demon challenge run and then got bodied. It's like somehow the game is aware of what I'm doing and actively making my experience miserable. <laughs> it's time to go back to Ikebukuro for some unfinished business. But before doing that, I made sure to level up to learn Rakunda. Inside the Montrez HQ, there is a door that you can only open if you have enough strength. Now that I meet the requirement, I can open it to grab Gaia. Another one of these physical resist Magatamas. Alright, it's finally time to get rid of this guy. When he's on your side, Daisoju is easily one of the best demons you can have in your party. He's also one of the most obnoxious bosses I've ever seen so far. Just like Matador, Daisoju gets to act before you do and what makes this really obnoxious is his unique skill. Meditation allows Daisoju to steal your HP and MP and then he gets healed by that same amount. The real problem here is that meditation drains a ton of MP. If he decides to cast it twice, at the start of the fight, you end up with 0 MP. You then have to use an item to restore it, but Daisoju can easily keep spamming the move to drain you over and over. Oh, and he has instant kill mode for both light and dark because that's always fun to deal with. There is a silver lining though. Daisoju doesn't know Dekunda, so he has no way to remove debuffs once they are applied. This makes Fog Breath really useful because decreasing his accuracy makes him less likely to land meditation or his other annoying moves. The monk did manage to kill me 16 times, but eventually Fog Breath finally started working as intended and I was able to slide punch my way to victory. With Matador, Hellbiker and Daisoju defeated, I have obtained 3 menorahs and you know what that means. It's time to explore the labyrinth of Amala! So, about the labyrinth. This is the new dungeon added in the Maniacs and Chronicle versions of the game. It has 5 different sections called Kalpas and in order to get the true demon ending, I'm gonna need to complete it. Interestingly enough, you access these Kalpas by jumping down some holes and playing this weird minigame where you collect coins and avoid obstacles? Yup, this is Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, the turn-based survival horror real-life simulator GRPG with minigames. Ok, time to explore the first Kalpa. As you keep exploring, you will find a switch that you can activate and it will open the way forward. Once you reach the end of the Kalpa, you can check the peephole and listen to the lady in black as she feeds you some lore. Kagutsuchi is the light whose sole purpose is to empower the one who will oversee creation. Creation is the act of bringing a new world into existence, made possible by the annihilation of the old world. After the lore dump, a door opens and I can resume my journey. I have enough menorahs so I can open the locked door and explore the second Kalpa, but before doing that, I need to prepare. I punched some demons to obtain aquamarines and after getting two of those, I traded my gems at Rag's jewelry for some smoke balls. This item allows you to escape from random encounters and I think it will come in handy pretty soon. So you remember how I was looking for a get rich quick scheme? Well, I was thinking about selling NFTs but I found something better. It just so happens that the second Kalpa has exactly what I need, but there is a catch. In order to get the bag, I need to go through a specific section of the Kalpa called the Curse Corridor. Ok, let's do this. One hour later. Yeah, this place is something else. In here you get damaged with each step you take, but wait, it gets worse. The enemies you face in this section are endgame over level demons who are way out of your reach at this point in time. There is no way for me to beat them, which is why I stocked up on smoke balls. But here's the thing. Since this is Nocturne, enemies have a chance to attack before you get to act and if that happens, you're dead. This is easily one of the scariest areas in Nocturne. I'm trying to get through it as fast as I can while the game keeps beating me up with each step I take. My eyes aren't glued to what's in front of me, no no no, they are looking at what's down here. As soon as the panning meter turns red, my anxiety level rises and I start sweating bullets. If I ever get into a fight, 
I have to hope and pray that I can survive and use the smog ball to get out of it as fast as possible. Okay, the ladder is in the next room. Come on, come on, I'm almost there. Please, for the love of God, come on! Oh, oh yes, I did it. If you manage to get here, you will impress Ifrit and he will give you a prize. 250k Maka. Yes, baby, give me the money. <laughs> uh, wait, hold up. I got the money, but there are no ways to fast travel out of the cow pass, so I have to get through that same curse corridor again without dying. And then I have to reach the exit of the cow pass without dying as well. <sighs> Uh, get me out of here! Go, 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 go! Ah! Stop! Stop! Uh, huh? Are you kidding me? Another random encounter! Nope, I'm not dealing with this. No, mm -mm -mm. get me out! Get me out! Get me out! Oh, yes! I made it! Oh. See? I wasn't kidding when I said that Nocturne is a survival horror game. With my newfound wealth, I can buy both Nirvana and Gehenna. Nirvana in particular is the Magatama I wanted the most because it allows me to learn Divine Shot, which is the best physical skill I can get my hands on at the moment. Speaking of skills, here is something important to know about them. In Nocturne, the only way to learn a skill is to level up while having a Magatama equipped. Every Magatama has a number of skills that you can learn as long as you meet the level requirement for said skill. The thing with Nocturne though, is that in order to learn a late skill, you need to go through all the previous skills leading to the one you want. Let's take Nirvana as an example. So for Divine Shot to become available, I need to learn or discard Violet Flash, then Anti-Light, and then Divine Shot will show up. Pretty simple, right? Well, there is something else that you need to consider. In Nocturne, there is no way to relearn a skill if you got rid of it. So once you discard the skill, it's gone forever. In the context of this challenge run, it makes the Magatama system very punishing. And just to hammer this point home, here is what a Kaiser, the person who wrote the Nocturne Hard TDE solo guide, had to say about this. The best advice I can give you is to meticulously plan which skills you want for each portion of the game. By doing so, you can efficiently plan your MC's progress and minimize the number of wasted skills thrown out. You can always grind for a level or three to learn a needed skill left on one, but you can't go back and relearn the skill later in the game when it might be helpful. Now, why is this relevant? Well, before starting this run, I had a rough idea of which skills I would want to have for some bosses, but I didn't plan out everything. While leveling up, I discarded both Violet Flash and Anti-Light because I knew these skills wouldn't be important for the run. Doing this unlocked Divine Shot, and once I reached level 42, I had to choose a skill to remove. And um, I removed Rakunda. Now, at the time, I didn't think much about it, but let me tell you, this is a big deal. There are only two skills that Demifin can learn to decrease an opponent's defense. Rakunda and Taunt. I already discarded Taunt, so now that Rakunda is also gone, it means that I have no way to increase my damage by decreasing the defense of my enemy. I sure hope that this doesn't end up biting me in the ass later. The Nihilo bros are causing a stir at the obelisk and I have to take care of them. W wait, do you... do you hear that? What is that sound? I think it's coming from this room over here. No, 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 no. Oh! <sighs> okay, so one of the things I've been doing so far is collecting every Magatama I come across. That's because once you collect all the 24 Dragon Balls, something really important will happen. Sadly, one of these Magatamas that I need to gather is a reward you get for completing this minigame. Puzzle Boy. Okay, so in this minigame, you control a pyro jack, and the goal is to bring the little fella to the blue cube to clear the stage. Sounds fine, right? Sounds fun, right? <laughs> the first few stages are easy to figure out, but as you keep going further, it gets more and more complex. There are 20 stages of this stupid minigame. 20! And you need to do them all in one go because there is no such thing as checkpoints, so buckle up, kiddo! It's Puzzle Boy time! Oh my god, this isn't a minigame. It's a torture device constructed by demons for the clear purpose of giving you severe brain damage. Oh, and that kid you see over here, he's going to keep taunting you while you play, just to add more salt to my sodium-infused body. And don't even get me started on the music. Ah, the music, oh my god. 
So once I realized that I would have to go through the same BS again, I just looked up a guide on YouTube. And what's funny is that even while following a guide, completing this entire thing still took me a while because I had to pause the video every second to make sure my tiny brain memorized what I needed to do. Uh, after more than an hour of this stupidity, I completed the last stage and I got the Magatama. I couldn't have done this without your guide, Buffmaster. Thank you for your service, comrade. Oh, thank god I won't have to redo this ever again. Okay, back to the main story. You have to go back to Ginza and follow the bridge until you find the second entrance of the assembly of Mudo. Eventually, you will reach the save point, and outside of that room will be standing the obelisk. And I gotta say, this is easily my favorite dungeon in the entire game. I love its design, it has fun puzzles to solve, and you really get an idea of how tall and colossal the place is as you climb this fictional Tower of Babel. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? After the obligatory segment where I get destroyed by random encounters for hours, I managed to reach the very top and the time has come to defeat the guardians of the obelisk, the Moire sisters, or as I like to call them, the MMO gang squad. And oh boy, this is rough. What makes this fight so difficult is how these three sisters synergize with each other. Clotho is going to use healing spells non-stop and if given enough time, she will be able to outheal your damage. Lachesis will make your job harder by increasing the defense of the squad while debuffing your own defense. And if that wasn't enough, she can also use Makakaja to boost the power of magic spells for the entire gang. Fun fact! In Nocturne, the potency of healing spells is affected by buffs and debuffs. This means that whenever Lachesis goes for Makakaja, she isn't just buffing Atropos, she's also boosting Clotho's healing spells, making it even harder to take her down. And then you also have to worry about Atropos. This Maiden in Black can use strong spells from each of the four elements. I tried as hard as I could, but in the end, I was unable to break through their formation. While losing was unsatisfying, my many failures against the trio gave me valuable information about the fight. Out of the three sisters, Clotho is the most important one to take down because her healing prevents me from making any progress. What makes this difficult to do is Atropos' offense. The best way to fix this is to block her elemental spells, and this is where the null skills come in handy. With that figured out, I grab Null Eyes from Miasma, Null Falls from Ifumi, and equip Gehenna to drain fire. Immediately at the start of the fight, I use Warcry twice to bring their magic attack down to minus 4. This is important because it drastically decreases the power of Clotho's healing. This buys me some time and I can use this opportunity to use Focus and go for Divine Shots. My first shot didn't crit, but my second one did, and thanks to that, my third Focus boosted Divine Shot was enough to take out the most annoying sister. With Clotho gone, this fight becomes a lot more manageable. I can slowly whittle down Lachesis until she's gone, and once that's done, it's just a matter of time until Atropos bites the dust. As a reward for my newest victory, I obtained the Magatama Jed, and this bug will allow me to learn buffing spells. The sisters are gone, so I can rescue the teacher. Now there's a little something I need to take care of. Inside the Ikebukuro tunnel, there are four Onis that I can defeat to claim another Magatama. The first one is Foki and he's really easy. You block force and then you cheese him with Fog Breath. The second one is Saki and he's really easy. You block ice and then you cheese him with Hellfire. The third one is Kinky and he's really... <laughs> he's really difficult, so I'm gonna forget about this guy until I'm stronger. I meet up with Ijiri and it's time to go back inside the Amala network for the second time. Yay! Unfortunately, that stupid Spectre is still alive somehow and it's ready for a round 2. The gimmick of this fight is that the Spectres know Megiddo, but they can't use it yet. They need MP for that, so they will repeatedly spam Mana Drain and then use the move. If you make sure you don't have MP, the Spectres won't be able to cast the scary move at all. These idiots will keep spamming Mana Drain even if they get nothing out of it, so you can just use this opportunity to easily finish them off one by one. Hmm, I wonder how Jin Girl is doing right now. <laughs> and she has gone crazy. Great. It's been a while since we last met, young man. Not only did you defeat my subordinates, but you single-handedly set the Maiden free. Perhaps you might wish to cooperate in delivering Shijima to the world. Do you not agree that the world should be ruled by serenity? 
Unfortunately for you, you are maidenless. Looks like I've made enough progress in the main story for now. You know what that means, right? Back to the labyrinth of Amala we go! Inside the Kalpas, you will find these grey doors that you visibly can't open. That's because they require a key that's hidden in the second Kalpa. After spending god knows how long in this maze, I found what I was looking for. With the key in my possession, I can jump down this hole, open the star-shaped door, and just like that we've reached the end of the second Kalpa. After jumping down this pipe, I'm now inside the third Kalpa and coming here for the first time awakens our next foes. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The first one you will be forced to deal with is White Rider. And I say forced, because right after the cutscene in the third Kalpa, this guy is going to stalk and harass you at the exit of every single terminal room. White Rider starts the fight by summoning two Virtues. The attack he loves spamming the most is Prominence, and if you have Gehenna equipped, you can drain that and end the enemy phase right away. No one here has the Kunda, so I did my usual war cry and fog breath shenanigans. White Rider got bodied by my divine shots, and then I used my beloved slide punch to finish off the virtues and grab the menorah of compassion. Beating White Rider means that I can go to the underpass of Ginza to challenge Red Rider, but uh Die! <laughs> yeah, this fight is insane. Uh, let's go somewhere else, please. I'm starting to get a decent amount of healing items, so now I can use my lucky tickets specifically for magic instances. This is great because I'm gonna need to rely on magic spells a lot more in the near future, and thanks to instances, I can boost my stats without needing to solely rely on leveling up. In Mannequin Land, there used to be a section that you couldn't access because it was under construction. Now it's finally open and it's exactly where I need to go. I exit Asakusa and enter inside the station to go through yet another tunnel filled with terrifying random encounters, and once I'm out of here, I can get inside Yoyogi Park from the second entrance. After reaching level 52, I learned Glacial Blast from Miasma and I also got to the end of the dungeon. It's time to defeat Sakahagi. Here we go again. But before I get a chance to do that, I have to defeat his Pokemon, which just so happens to be my favorite demon in the entire series, Giri Mekala. If you've never seen this demon before, allow me to show you what Giri is known for. Yeah, Giri Mikala repels physical attacks back at you, so you can't use them. And in typical Nocturne fashion, this guy has no weakness. Your only way to deal damage to this demon is with spells. This is exactly why I started pumping my magic stat, but uh, we have a problem. This fight is brutal. If you check the top right corner, it looks like Giri only has two press turns, but that's a lie. Giri always uses his first press turn icon to cast Beast Eye, which grants him two additional press turns, so in reality, he gets act 3 times in a row. And this is where the issue truly lies. Even with a physical resist Magatama, I take too much damage. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, hey, why don't you use Warcry to decrease his attack? That's a valid question, but unfortunately, Giri Mikala's AI is coded to use Dekunda as soon as it detects any kind of debuff. Without the ability to decrease his attack, I am forced to heal myself every turn because he deals too much damage. I can't think of a good strategy to tackle this boss, so for the time being, let's do something else. Something that I find pretty funny in this city is that there is a Dekarabia who is apparently supposed to meet with Fornius. You know, that same Fornius we defeated in the medical center? Yeah, if you tell Dekarabia that you slaughtered his body, he won't believe you. Legends say that to this day, Dekarabia is still waiting for Fornius. I like how in SMT5, Dekarabia and Fornius have a special dialogue and they actually reference this little storyline from Nocturne. It's a really nice touch. Now, the main reason behind my return to Shibuya is because there's actually a hidden boss fight in this town. Instead of describing this scene, <laughs> I'm just going to show it to you. Damn it, damn it, damn it! I'm tired of everyone dunking on us just because we're mannequins! Well, you know what? We're about to hit him with the longest, strongest, wrongest demon of them all! Hell yeah, we are! It's payback time, suckers! I don't know the details, but they say this guy is an absolute unit. And if Mara really is that magnificent, then hurry up and whip him out already! <laughs> Clearly you two are first timers. Besides, Mara is... Uh, how should I say? A fickle demon. Were we to rouse him prematurely, he would not be able to come to us at full strength. He would not be able to come at full strength. We're done being jerked around by the bad guys, so will you summon our mean green pounding machine or not? Do you 
not know that summoning is a consummate act of com- Guy on the right is right, Mr. Baphomet. We need the demonic hookups, yo. Hey, you, half-naked demon dude. Back us up, bro. Tell Goatface here to summon Mara and give us a ride on the gravy train. See, three against one. Now hurry up and get this Mara party started. <laughs> Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> well, in my rush, I have summoned Mara the Magnificent in the incomplete body of a- Come! <laughs> <laughs> In case you're confused, this is what Mara is supposed to look like. Oh, sorry, um, I, I meant like this. Makes a lot more sense now, don't you think? Unfortunately for Mara, it got the short end of the stick in Nocturne, but it's okay because we all come in different shapes and sizes. Mara has one gimmick. If you damage this blob, he will always cast the Arahan to fully heal himself. So realistically speaking, you have two ways to beat this boss. You can either let him run out of MP to make sure he can't use the Arahan anymore, or you one-shot him. With only one press turn, it's pretty difficult to one-shot Mara, but fortunately for me, there is another way. Once you deal enough damage to Mara, you will reach the dialogue prompt. After that, Mara is guaranteed to use this Maltune and then the Arahan. He will always use this Maltune first, and that's a cursed attack. So if I equip the Jet Magatama to null curse, I can guarantee that Mara's turn will end, preventing the blob from using the Arahan. So instead of being forced to one-shot this guy, I can try to two-shot him. So here is the strat. After surviving Mara's rampage at the start of the fight, you fully debuff him. This will make it easier to penetrate his defenses. Next, you gotta pump out more damage. The vigorous thrusts of your divine shots will result in an explosive climax, forcing the blob to submit. <laughs> And just like that, I managed to obtain the Moss Spell Magatama. This fight was really fun, but alas, we must return to the Elephant Conundrum. Giri Mekala completely shuts me down. I can't use Divine Shot because he repels physical. I can't use Debuffs because he will immediately remove them. And he has 3 actions per turn, making it impossible for me to do anything except healing myself. So you're probably wondering, how is he going to beat this boss? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I just realized that one specific skill in particular was perfect for this exact situation. That skill is Sukukaja, and it's a buff that raises my evasion and accuracy. Giri Mekala can remove debuffs, but he cannot do the same with buffs. So by clicking Sukukaja four times in a row, I can max out my evasion, and this makes it extremely easy to dodge whatever Giri Mekala tries to do. I don't have to heal myself all the time anymore, so I can actually use Glacial Blast to deal damage. With such a hard-hitting spell and my evasion cheese, the elephant goes down, but the fight isn't over just yet because I have to fight Sakahagi right after the demon falls. You're one hell of a monster. I used all that Magatsuhi to summon that demon, and look what happened! Enough of this! Anyone who gets in my way I have enough cash now, so I can purchase Kamurogi. This Magatama is really good because it will allow me to learn one of the best physical skills for this run. You will see what I mean later. It's time for the salty run back against Kinky. Kinky is a certified Nocturne tryhard. He can buff, he can debuff, and he hits really hard with physical attacks. It's a pretty difficult fight, but this time I am better equipped and Glacial Blast is more than enough to get the job done. With the three Onis out of the way, I can finally fight the most dangerous member of the seven, Black Noir. This boss can create fake copies of himself. If you don't know how the fight works, it's kinda tough, but there's actually a way to tell which one is the real deal. As long as you start the fight when the Kagusuchi phase is full, you will be able to see a shadow beneath the real Black Noir. Outside of that, on paper, this boss looks pretty free. His two physical attacks are Stasis Blade and Dark Sword, really hard hitting moves with low accuracy. Black Noir doesn't have the Kaja, so I can raise my evasion and that should make it impossible for his big attacks to hit me. Uh, okay, so there is something that I want you to keep in mind. The description of Stasis Blade and Dark Sword state that both attacks have low accuracy. Low accuracy. So if this is indeed true, how do you explain this?
this game is lying to me and I refuse to believe otherwise. There is no way in hell an attack with low accuracy could hit me that often. Like how? How is he hitting me here? I'm at plus four evasion, bro, huh? I, I was trying to write something interesting for this section, but in the script, but, ugh. but you know what? No, I refuse to do that. Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should treat yourself now. With the boss gone, I can enter inside this room and grab Murakumo, another pretty useful physical resist Magatama. Psst, hey. So, um, I have a favor to ask, between you and me. Let's pretend that this never happened. We will never talk about the Black Noir incident ever again. Sounds good? Sounds good. If you go back to the Kabukicho prison, you will find a new boss waiting for you there, Black Frost. And this guy is, uh... uh... The fight itself is actually not that difficult. Black Frost will spam ice attacks and try to one-shot you with Mamodoon. Now, what really makes this fight tedious is the stupid amount of resistances Black Frost has. He has an incredibly high resistance to physical attacks, so you can forget about using that. Also, he drains ice, he nullifies fire. Oh, and let's not forget Nocturne's trademark. No weakness. Realistically speaking, I can only use a leg or force to deal damage. I don't have those spells available right now, so I have to chuck 4 stones at this boss until he dies. And since I don't have any way to block Dark, at any point during the fight, if this clown gets lucky, he can just one-shot me and then I have to restart the entire thing all over again. Black Frost, you have committed the greatest sin a boss can do in a challenge run. You're not fun, you're not challenging, you are boring. And I have only one thing left to say to the likes of you. Judgment has come to you. And there you go, Black Frost is no more and this allows me to grab the Magatama Satan. This time, Hidri gets sucked into the Amala drum, which means that we have to go back to the Amala network for a third time. And guess who's waiting for us there? Yup, it's our good old buddy Spectre who's ready for round 3. I don't know why it's spinning twice here, but <laughs> I find that pretty funny. So the third Spectre fight is pretty difficult. You have to deal with 6 of them and this time the Spectres have a new trick up their sleeves. If they get too low, they will use last resort to self-destruct and deal a lot of damage to you. And whenever that happens, one of the remaining Spectres will use Gathering to summon a new one. These guys resist every form of magic, so physical is the way to go here. When you take all of these things into account, it means that the best way to deal with this fight is to use an AoE physical attack and kill all the Spectres in one fell swoop, which is easier said than done. I simply cannot deal enough damage to take out every Spectre at once. As I kept dying to these guys, I started asking myself a question. Can the Spectres resummon infinitely? Well, there is only one way to find out. I need to keep killing a Spectre every time it gets summoned and see if eventually something happens. There can only be 6 Spectres on the field, so as long as I focus on one of them, I only have one enemy to worry about. And so I kept one-shotting the Spectre until I saw something very interesting. If the battle lasts long enough, eventually all the remaining Spectres will explode at the same time. Unfortunately for them, they were all at minus 4 accuracy, so Demifin just dodged every single explosion and I was able to finish off the last Spectre with a powerful Divine Shot. Thankfully, this is the last time we will ever have to deal with the Amala network. Unfortunately, however, what comes next is easily one of my least favorite parts of the game. The Amala Temples. Let's start with the Black Temple. Our main target here is Asiel. You know, whenever I see this boss's design, the way half of its face is hidden underneath the ground, I can't help but think about Diglett. 
As a kid playing Pokemon, I always wondered what Diglett truly looks like under the ground. You, you know what? Forget about Diglett. I don't think I want to know anymore. There are two things that Asiel is known for. The first one is using Dragonite and spamming Mana Drain to suck all your MP. The second is trying to get this video demonetized by baiting me into saying the N-word. Yeah, nice try, buddy. <laughs> I'm not gonna pronounce that word. That attack's name is Latin for Black Sun, so let's just call it that. After using his Dragonite into Mana Drain combo, on the following turn, Asiel is guaranteed to go for Black Sun, which always drops you down to 1 HP. When Asiel goes for Black Sun, he is guaranteed to follow it up with a basic attack, so if you use an attack mirror before that happens, you will repel the basic attack and survive the turn. If I was a normal human being, I would grind gems and trade them at Rags Jewelry to obtain a lot of attack mirrors for this fight, but remember, I'm a Shin Megumi Tensei fan. Clearly something isn't right with me. So instead of doing that, I relied on another strategy. Dodge strike, baby! Now, if I'm being honest, this is definitely not a good strategy for this fight, and I kept getting destroyed because of it, but listen. That feeling you get when you know you can die at any point if Astia lands his physical attack, but then you dodge? Mmm, I find it way too addicting. I kept dodging Asiel's attacks at 1 HP, and then I sent him 6 feet under with my final divine shot. One temple down, two more to go. It's time to explore the White Temple, a place that's filled with invisible teleporters everywhere that you need to take in a specific order to reach the boss. It's a bit confusing, but if your remaining brain cells haven't been fried by this game yet, you will eventually figure out how to move forward. And when you do figure it out, you will come face to face with DJ Albion. This fight has a pretty interesting gimmick. If you defeat Albion, his goons can summon him back. If you defeat the goons, Albion can bring them back. So basically, you have to defeat them at the same time. One thing that I didn't realize at first is that you don't need to defeat all 5 of them at the same time. Albion will only resummon his bodies if all 4 of them are dead, so you can take out 3 of the goons and leave the last one alive. From there, it's just a matter of bringing them low enough and ending the fight with your physical attacks. And with this victory, I have obtained Magatama Adama. This means that there is only one temple left, and oh boy, it's the worst one. Allow me to introduce you to the Red Temple. As soon as you step into the darkness, you will get sent to the Shadow Realm, a place filled with damaging tiles on the floor where you can't make any progress. If you get sent there, you have to keep working until you find the glowing exit that brings you back to the real world and try again. But uh, <laughs> there is the thing! In this stupid dungeon, there are many instances where you have to go through a door without knowing what's behind it. Oh look, you just opened the door, but guess what? There are shadows right beneath where you are standing. Do you know what that means? Swiggity Swaggo Realm, say hello to the Shadow Realm! But wait, 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 wait! That's just for the first floor! There is more! On the second floor of this stupid ass dungeon, you have to get sent to the Shadow Realm on purpose to then exit that place and follow the Da Vinci Code to reach the path leading to the boss. <laughs> Nocturne! <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about the boss of this area. Skadi is definitely the hardest boss of the Temple Trio. This is due in part to her varied moveset, but what makes Skadi truly scary is her unique skill called Earthquake. This attack hits like a truck and it pretty much forces you to equip a physical resist Magatama to deal with it. Earthquake is really dangerous, but there is a way to tell when she will use it. Skadi will always go for Tarukaja twice in a row before using Earthquake on the following turn, so if you see that exact pattern, you know what to expect. It's a really demanding fight where you have to constantly keep her in check with your debuffs, but as long as you manage to do that, victory will be yours. With the third temple completed, I can enter inside the inverted pyramid. Isamu drops Hijiri into the Kool-Aid and sacrifices him to summon his god, Noah. What do you think of my god? Awesome, right? Hear that, Noah? Lance wants something a bit meatier. And then they leave, meaning that all this temple BS was for nothing. Great. Interestingly enough, as I was exploring the area, a random Dominion asked to become a member of my party, and I said yes for a very specific reason. This will make more sense later. I don't plan to use this guy in combat, so he's gonna chill in the back with Pixie for the time being. <sighs> I knew this day would come. If you go back to Asakusa right now, a message will state that the city is silent. And once you go to Mifunashiro, you will understand why. Jin Girl and her forces are raiding the place, leaving nothing but destruction in their path for conquest. We have officially reached the saddest part of the game for me. You know what's messed up about this dungeon? Some of the random encounters have mannequins in them, and I really don't want to fight these guys. Alas, I can't flee from fights. 
I even tried talking to them to persuade them to stop this nonsense, but it also doesn't work. What makes this even worse for me is that these guys actually draw beads, which are invaluable in this challenge, so I am rewarded for beating them. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I need the beads. When I got to this part in my first playthrough, I didn't notice it, but if you look up, you can see angels flying all over the place. But that's not all, you can also see mannequins falling to their death. That really caught me off guard. As twisted and messed up as this is, it's honestly a really cool example of environmental storytelling. We aren't told what's happening here, it's shown to us, and it makes this section of the game a lot more impactful for me. At the end of the dungeon, we find Chiaki with Futomimi, and it's here that you get to make a choice. If you side with Chiaki, you will fight Futomimi. If you disagree with her, you will end up fighting the Archangel Trio. Out of the two fights, Futomimi is definitely the easier one, so considering the type of challenge I'm doing right now, uh, siding with Shiaki is the most logical thing to do. You would never partake in such a brutal act, would you? Your heart is unlike any demons, is it not? Come on. I know you understand what I mean. I will never betray my homie Futomimi, so it's time to defeat the Archangels. The Archangels have no way to remove debuffs, so I can decrease the damage output with Warcry and heavily decrease their evasion and accuracy with Fog Breath. This makes the fight a lot more manageable, and it also allows me to showcase my new skill, Iron Claw Gaming. This is the godlike skill I was talking about when I bought the Kamurogi Magatama. You see, Iron Claw deals a lot of damage and it has a high chance to crit, but there is a catch. Its accuracy is really bad. If you use it normally, you will end up missing a lot, but when you have Fog Breath or Sukukaja, you can completely offset the accuracy penalty. So now I have a hard hitting attack, and if Iron Claw crits, I deal even more damage, and it grants me an extra action that I can use to attack or heal myself. The three Archangels tried as hard as they could, but in the end, they were powerless in the face of Iron Claw Gaming. Yeah, regardless of what you picked, there is no way to save Futomimi. I really wish Atlas made a mannequin ending DLC or something, but alas, it was never meant to be. After this unfortunate event, we then get to witness the birth of Shiaki's new form. And I have to say, I prefer her whole design over this one. You know, this entire time, whenever I needed to buy items or heal myself, I always went to Asakusa. There are plenty of other towns where you could achieve the same thing, but that place was truly unique because of the mannequins. Seeing these weird twitchy dudes slowly rebuilding their city was great. I also felt safe here because you couldn't get attacked by demons. Asakusa used to be synonymous with comfort and happiness for me. But now, it's a ghost town. The mannequins I used to see in the streets of the city are nowhere to be found, and the place is overrun by demons. When I started this journey, it was just for myself, but now, things are different. I'm not just doing this for myself. I am also doing it for the mannequins of Asakusa and their leader Futomimi. Their story will not be forgotten, and I will make sure that justice is served. Isamu and Chiaki have awakened their gods. Vegeta is the only one left, so it's time to pay him a visit. He's inside the Diet Building, and to get there, I will need to go through the Yurakucho Station. Nope, no, 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 mm -mm -mm -mm. we are not doing this right now, uh-uh. In one of the tunnels, you will find Shige the Prospector. This guy can dig out a really cool treasure, but for that to happen, you're gonna have to give him one of your demons to help. One thing to keep in mind though, is that the demon you give is guaranteed to die once the process is over. There is no way I'm giving my pixie to this guy, so... <laughs> it's time to put this dominion to good use. It will take some time before Shige gets the job done, so I'm gonna come back here later. Now I can explore the diet building. M mercy! Uh, grant me mercy! Death's damnable shadow is upon me! To err is human, to forgive divine! Let me join thy worthy ranks, and spare me in return! Damn it! The first thing on the menu is taking down Cert. Wait. Oh no, it's this guy again. You see, Cert is the boss I have a bit of history with. In my SMT5 No Demon Run, this guy managed to kill me five times in a row because of random ass crits. But this was in the past. Today I'm playing a different game, so I'm sure that things will be different.
As per tradition, Sword is easy until he isn't. He has really strong fire spells, but you can deal with that by draining them with the Magatama Magehena. The real issue is when he decides to use physical move, but too bad for him! I have the dog strike, baby! Obviously, since this is Nocturne, this guy doesn't have a weakness, but it's not a problem because Glacial Blast, powered by Ice Boost, is all you need to take care of this clown. With Cert gone, we can finally explore the place. The Diet Building is easily one of my favorite dungeons. As you keep going, various bosses will try to halt your progress by tricking you with optical illusions. It's pretty neat. I made sure to reach level 66 and now I'm ready to face Mada. Mada is one of those bosses who always start to fight by attacking first, so you know, that's fun. Intoxicate is his favorite move and it's easily the most annoying part of the fight. If he hits you with it, you are now confused and you can just waste your turn by doing something stupid like dropping your maca while he keeps pummeling you. This clearly wasn't going to work so I reloaded my save and before leveling up, I equipped Murakumo to learn Null Mind. This passive skill blocks Panic, Charm and Sleep. It's exactly what I needed and it makes the Mada fight bearable. From time to time, this boss will summon a Pazuzu who can use Media Rama to heal the squad. Now, you might think that I despise this Pazuzu, but it's actually quite the opposite. Mada doesn't have any weaknesses, but Pazuzu does. He is weak to ice and I just so happen to have Glacial Blast. So whenever I click this move, I get to one-shot Pazuzu, deal damage to Mada and I also get to act again because I hit a weakness. This improved my DPS and after getting rid of the Pazuzu for the second time, Mada fell for good. With another win under my belt, I felt really confident, so I decided to go back to the underpass to challenge Red Rider. Oh my god! This fight is hell! Red Rider always starts the fight by summoning two powers and these guys are going to spam Tarukaja until their attack is maxed. This is pretty bad because plus 4 attack means that they will deal double damage to you. And then there is Red Rider! His unique skill is Terror Blade. It's a physical skill and it can hit you once, or if it feels like it, it will hit you twice. But wait, there is more! He also has the Elect Move Bolt Storm, as well as the Force Attack Wind Cutter for coverage, and these spells hit hard. Now, you might be thinking that the answer is to debuff these guys, but mm, no, 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 no! Red Rider has the Kunda, so you can bring them into the negative. Even if you remove the buffs, the power can just click Tarukaja to raise their physical attack again. To win this fight, there is only one viable strategy. Dodge tanking. I have to somehow manage to max out my evasion and pray that I dodge and man, this is not working. This fight is pure luck and there is no way around it. If you don't dodge, you die. If they get a crit, you die. If the power stuns you with guillotine, you die. If you are low and terribly hits you twice, you die. If the amount from the power lands, you die. It has reached the point where I have to attack with reckless abandon and hope that I dodge most attacks. Iron Claw Gaming truly shines in this fight. I kept critting and critting and eventually with my third crit, I finally managed to defeat Red Rider and I slide punch his goons to seal the deal. Another fiend bites the dust and I obtain the menorah of insight. Speaking of fiends, it's time to fight the one residing in Yoyogi Park, Mother Harlot. I gotta say, I like the thing she does with her jaws. You know, the <laughs> Mother Harlot repel physical, so it's a fight where you need to use magic attacks. One thing that makes her unique is that her basic attack hits you 7 times. This might not look scary at first, but let me tell you, if she goes for focus, the damage racks up really fast. The Harlot also has an attack called Beast Roar, and it heals her by 10% of her max HP. She has 5k in total, so every Beast Roar is going to give her 500 HP for free. This move puts pressure on you because now you have to outdamage her healing in order to win. Sukukaja and Null Mind are two very important skills for this fight. Null Mind blocks her dangerous attack Death Lust, and with Suku, I'm more likely to dodge, which means that I can focus on the offense. It took me a couple of tries, but thanks to these two skills, I got more opportunities to click Glacial Blast and eventually, Mother Harlot tasted the pleasure of death. After that fight, I decided to meet Shige again and he finally finished digging the tunnel. You can grab some pretty decent rewards in here and Shige will then give you the Kimon Stone. This is what I was looking for. With this item, I can go to the shrine near Asakusa and open the sealed door to fight Bishamon. In his current state, Bishamon isn't too difficult. He hits hard, but as long as you have Glacial Blast to hit the weakness, the fight shouldn't take too long. As a reward for beating him, you get the Magatama Gundari. If it feels like I went over this fight quickly, it's because this is just round 1. You get to fight him again later and... Uh, <laughs> I will talk about it once we get there.
After that, I learned Bolt Storm from Adama, and I went back to the diet building to challenge Mott. Oh boy, here we go. It's time for the memes. So alongside Matador, Mott is probably one of the most infamous bosses in Nocturne. On paper, it looks like a pretty straightforward fight. For the first time in like forever, it's a main boss with an actual weakness. So what's the deal with Mott? Well, you see, our coffin enjoyer over here is quite unique. Many bosses in this game can use moves like Beast Eye or Dragon Eye to grant themselves more press turn icons. These moves are really powerful, but they have a limitation in place to prevent bosses from spamming them. This is true for most bosses, however, these limitations don't apply to Mod because, you see, this guy is just built different. For whatever reason, Mod can use Beast Eye more than once, and technically, if he really feels like it, he can just keep doing that for a while. This boss can single-handedly change the way the game works. It becomes a turn-based JRPG, except you never get your turn. <laughs> you know, now that I think about it, this is probably how it feels to be on the receiving end of a chain attack in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Now, I really wish I had a funny story to tell you about how this fight went, like how Mott used Beast Eye 69 times in a row, but um, that didn't happen. I kept dodging and clicking both storm, and then he died. Up next comes Mifra, and this boss has a simple plan. Spamming instant kill until you die. And the way to deal with this one is also fairly simple. Equip Anathema to Null Dark, learn Null Light from Nirvana, and then congrats! Now he has no way to one-shot you, and you can just finish him off with Iron Claw Gaming. Before going any further, I equip Murakumo and leveled up to learn Null Nerve, a skill that blocks stun and bind. Once that was done, I challenged Vegeta again, and I had to defeat his ace Pokemon. Slifer the Sky Dragon. Slifer has a unique move called God's Curse, which inflicts a random ailment on you. Fortunately for me, with Null Mind and Null Nerve, I can pretty much guarantee that it won't hit me. This boss also has Retaliate, which is a stronger version of Counter. You might think that using physical attacks is a bad idea because of Retaliate, but it's still the way to go here. Magic spells like Glacial Blast deal zero damage. Meanwhile, Iron Clock Gaming deals a lot of damage naturally, and if it crits, I get to heal myself if needed, or go for a focus. This move is absolutely fantastic, and after landing crit after crit, I managed to send Slifer to the Shadow Realm. With enough Magatsui in his possession, Vegeta managed to summon his god, Ariman, and this is easily one of the best demon designs I've ever seen in this series. Now that the three gods have shown themselves, I can open the path to the final dungeon, but I won't be setting foot in that place just yet. You see, once you enter inside that tower, the game locks you into an ending, and in order to get the true demon ending, I have to finish the labyrinth of Amala first, which means that there is only one thing left to do. It's time to go fiend hunting. I went back to the medical center to fight Black Rider, and that fight was surprisingly easy. I equipped Omagatama to Null Curse, gave him a taste of my Iron Claw gaming, and grabbed my reward. With the menorahs obtained from the three riders, the path to the third Kalpa has been unlocked. This Kalpa has one of the wildest segments I've ever seen in a JRPG. Let me show you what I mean. There's our star of the show. This gate will serve as the starting point. Take one step beyond it, and Rido will make you regret being born into this world. One. Uh. Two. Uh. uh. Three. What? Oh, he's behind me! Woo! 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 That's one switch. Get away! I can hear his footsteps. I can hear the footsteps. Where is he? Where is he? Ooh! Okay, that's one door opened. Is he? I don't see him. Are you... Are you gonna move? Are you... Uh, he's just standing there. Menacingly! Is he? Stop shooting! Run! Run, Demi Fiend! Run! 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 
Yes. Yes, the exit. Yes. Yes, let's go. Are you gonna move? Ooh! 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 Run, Demi Fiend! Run! Okay, I think I have him now. Uh, uh, run! Let's go, yes! Let's go! Oh, freedom! Oh! Did you forget what Rido does for a living? He could chase someone down in his sleep. Anyways, we have you right where we want you. Rido, do not let him slip away! I will have my revenge, Rido. I'm sure a man of your caliber would back down from a challenge. Now, show us what you're made of. Ah, yes, of course. Of course he gets to attack before I can even move. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nocturne. Oh, wow, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. You're stronger, but so am I, Rido. Let's see how you deal with my cheese. <laughs> Dodge stride, baby! Plus three. Once I'm at plus four, I can start playing the game. Nice try, Rido. This is what you get. This is payback for all the suffering you made me go through. Oh wow, of course he creates that all. Uh oh. Oh oh. Rido, stop! Stop! Oh. This guy. Jesus Christ. This can't miss, but you can't panic me anymore. So this is fine. All right, let me give you a taste of my Iron Claw Gaming. It's as if you got stronger overnight. Color me impressed, Demi Fiend. Uh oh. Oh, let's go. He's almost dead. Perhaps we underestimated him. Righto, this is your cue to pull out all the stops. I mean it! Use any and every trick you have left up your sleeve. Go, Righto! Uh oh. Oh no. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh! I just need one hit. You know what? I think I can kill him right now. Die, Rido! Let's go! Iron Claw Gaming! Yeah! Man, I can't remember the last time a GRPG made me feel genuine fear like this. After dealing with Rido's fun minigame, I got my daily dose of lore from the Lady in Black and officially completed the third Kalpa. The next thing I need to deal with is the leader of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Pale Rider. This is easily one of the most cancerous boss fights in this challenge run. Pale Rider starts the fight by summoning two Loas and these guys suck. They can spam Stone Gaze and if it lands, you will die. And wait, it gets even better. The Loas can explode to deal a lot of damage to you and for whatever reason, Pale Rider gets healed by that attack. Thank you Shin Megami Tensei. But everything I said so far pales in comparison to the most stupid idiotic and obnoxious move these guys can use. Debilitate! Debilitate drops all your stats by one stage, so whenever they use it, my attack, defense, accuracy, as well as evasion all go down to minus one. Now, some of you might be wondering, why don't you just use the Kunda to remove the debuffs then? 
<laughs> this is where things get interesting, guys. You see, in this game, Demifin has no way to learn the Kunda. This wouldn't be a problem if there was an item that you could use to remove debuffs, but that also doesn't exist. For some reason, Atlus, in their infinite wisdom, decided to create the Kaja stones, but didn't do the same for the Kunda stones. So if the Loas decide to spam Debilitate, there is nothing I can do. Attacking the Loas is pointless because Pale Rider can infinitely summon them. In order to improve my odds of winning, I did two things. First, I learned the skill Null Curse to prevent the Loas from poisoning me. I also got the Drain Eyes and this skill is very useful for this fight. See, what makes Drain and Repel so amazing is that they don't just take away the enemy's press turns, they completely shut down the enemy phase. Pale Rider has Mabufudan and he always attacks first. This means that whenever he goes for an ice attack, I can recover HP and end the enemy phase right away, preventing the stupid Loas from attacking. But even with these things figured out, this absolute dumpster fire of a fight didn't get any easier. I kept dying for hours until finally I got a run where the Loas didn't spam debilitate and Iron Claw Gaming managed to take out Pale Rider. Since I was still in Asakusa, I used this opportunity to visit the Collector Mannequin to purchase the Magatama Vimana, and I did that specifically because this Magatama has the skill Endure. Endure allows you to survive a lethal attack once and it's going to be extremely important for the upcoming boss fight. Also, it's nice to see a Mannequin again. After reaching level 80 and learning Endure, I went back to the Yurakusho station and challenged the last fiend, Trumpeter, or as I like to call him, Trump. Nothing could have prepared me for the insanity of this boss fight. Trump has two unique moves, Holy Melody and Evil Melody. Holy Melody is a full HP and MP heal for whoever has the lowest health in terms of percentage. As for Evil Melody, it will instantly kill the party member with the lowest HP percentage. As I'm sure you can tell, I don't have any party members with me, so Evil Melody is a guaranteed one-shot on Demifin. This is pretty bad, but don't worry, it's about to get worse. Every fourth turn, Trump will alternate between Holy Melody and Evil Melody, and the order is set from the very moment the battle begins. Trump gets to act first, and he always opens with Holy Melody. This means that if you don't manage to defeat him in four turns, he will use Evil Melody and you will automatically lose. That being said, there is a way to cheat death, and it's with the skill Endure. It works on Evil Melody, which means that you can survive the fourth turn. Thing is, it only works once, and on turn 12, he will use Evil Melody for the second time. So in order to win, you must defeat Trumpeter before the second Evil Melody comes out. Because the battle is scripted, this exact scenario is guaranteed to happen every time. This means that you have 12 turns to deal 11k damage. If you fail, you are dead. This mechanic turns a boss fight into a sweaty DPS race. Without any way to buff my attack or debuff my opponent's defense, I had to rely on the only thing that could save me, critical hits. It took me many hours, but after getting killed 37 times in a row, I finally got the attempt I was looking for. Come on, come on, come on, come on. This is it. This is the turn. This is my last turn to kill it. Come on. Yes! Yes! Yes, I did it! Okay, let's explore the fourth Kalpa. Ah, great. We are doing this again, huh? Further into the dungeon, you will find a corridor which can lead you to various places based on the Kagutsushi phase. Going in when it's a new moon leads to Hell's Hall, where a very powerful foe resides. Now, prove your strength to me. Belzebub is the tankiest boss I've ever seen so far, and what makes this problematic is the amount of resistances this boss has. Belzebub resists physical, ice, force, and elect, meaning that attacks from these elements will always deal less damage. It doesn't resist fire, so that should be the natural answer, but uh, I can't use that. There are only three fire spells that Demifin can learn. Fire Breath, Hellfire, and Magma Axis. I have already dropped two of these spells, so I can't get them anymore. As for Magma Axis, I could learn it, but doing that would force me to learn Fire Drain first, and I simply cannot afford to do that. Which means that my best option is Iron Claw Gaming, and uh, based on how much damage I'm dealing right now, I think you can understand why I said that this boss was tanky. The fight is manageable at the start because you can fully buff yourself and debuff him, but once phase 2 starts, the difficulty slider gets cranked up to 11. Feel my power, Jimmy Fiend. 
Now Belzebub can use both Dekaja and Dekunda, but that's not all. He can also use Death Flies, a severe or mighty attack which is guaranteed to kill you if you don't nullify Dark. Fortunately, I knew about this, so I made sure to wait until this fight to learn Null Dark. The biggest issue in this phase is that Belzebub actively spams Dekunda, making it very difficult to keep any kind of debuff on him for a long time. I wasn't aware of this at the time, but Belzebub has a hidden mechanic. If he detects that you fully debuffed him, his AI will go berserk and regularly spam Dekunda. And when I say spam, it's to the point where I can sometimes go for Dekunda every time I use Warcry. What I thought was an opening to fully debuff him in phase 1 ended up being a trap, and now the fight is even more difficult. After 21 minutes of pure struggle, I landed the crate with my Iron Claw Gaming, and that made Belzebub's idol animation change. He was getting weaker, and I was getting closer and closer to the finish line. As if he knew that the end was near, Belzebub became even more aggressive, using powerful attacks and Dekunda repeatedly. There were many close calls, and this fight became even more nerve-wracking, but I knew what needed to be done. So I put all my faith in Iron Claw, and with a final crit, I defeated the giant fruit fly. Man, that was a crazy fight. I have to say, I really enjoy when games make you face giant bosses, especially in this series. Like, Belzebub is so tall that half of the time I couldn't even see my damage numbers very well. Nocturne has a lot of battles like this one, and I love it. Now, you would expect the path to the next Scalpa to be right after Belzebub, but that's not the case. Wait, let me check my notes again. So, to reach the fifth Scalpa, you have to talk to the Mothman before the Go Belzebub back to the second arena, Kalpa find to Loki at the bar, one talk to the and jump down, down the hole which leads then you to a unique area of the fourth Kalpa, and then Kalpa, you have to go where back to the fourth switch Kalpa to normally the door. and go through that newly unlocked path to reach the fifth Kalpa. Thank you, Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. After all of these shenanigans, I went back to the third Kalpa. If you go to this specific room, you will find the same Black Frost we fought in the past, but this time, instead of fighting you, he will become your ally. Just like that dominion I sacrificed for the Kimon Stone, I have a specific plan for this little guy. At last, we have finally reached the fifth Kalpa, the last floor of this god-forsaken labyrinth. In this Kalpa, there are many doors that you need to go through, and each door can only be opened if you have a demon with specific attributes. This is mandatory in order to progress, and it's exactly why I let Black Frost join me without my consent. This door here requires a demon with 25 strength or higher. Black Frost has 24 strength, so I can use a strength incense to bump that stat to 25, and now I can pass. The next door requires the demon who has been with you the longest. Remember how back in Yoyogi Park I said that you should keep your pixie around? It's time to show you why. I'm Pixie of the Fairy Clan. Please take care of me. Hey, my little pixie evolved and turned into Uber Pixie. Now she has better stats and useful spells too. The rest of the doors all require a demon with various high stats, and since Pixie has 30 in all of them, she can easily open all these doors for me. This gives me access to useful items, and it also opens the path for the last boss of Amala. But before facing that foe, I need to prepare. I abused lucky tickets for big chains, and then I leveled up to learn new skills. I learned Retaliate at level 85 and Rakukaja at 87. Now I can counter physical skills and buff my defense as well. With my preparation completed, I went back to the fifth Kalpa and opened the last door in my way. Oh brother, this fight is ridiculous. Metatron has three phases and his behavior will drastically change with each phase it goes through. In phase 1, Metatron will immediately cast Dekaja and Dekunda if he detects any buffs or debuffs, so it's pointless to use them. During this phase, I can only attack if Metatron goes for light moves and I have a decent amount of HP left. These attacks get blocked by my Magatama, so I can sneak in a Glacial Blast here and there. However, if he goes for anything else, I am forced to heal after every enemy phase and rely on the power of our Lord and Savior, Counter. This is one of those fights where I have to play defensively, and it's exactly why I got Retaliate. Each basic attack from Metatron becomes an opportunity for me to deal damage. Once you reach phase 2, this fight gets even harder. 
Metatron will start using Tarukaja and Makakaja to deal even more damage to you. The good thing about this phase is that Metatron stops spamming the Kaja and the Kunda, so you can start buffing yourself and debuffing him. This AI change allows me to use Warcry and Rakukaja to make surviving a lot easier. Unfortunately, once you reach phase 2, he gets access to this move. Oh shit! Here we go again. Every time he goes for that stupid move, all my stats get decreased, and this is really bad because it means that my accuracy goes down. This is the most debilitating aspect of this spell, because at minus 2 accuracy, my Glacial Blast becomes too unreliable to hit Metatron. It gets to the point where I simply cannot attack anymore, meaning that Retaliate becomes my only source of damage. And it somehow gets even worse when you reach the third phase. In phase 3, Metatron gets access to his deadliest move. Fire of Sinai can hit you up to 2 times, and this can be the difference between life or death. And just to rub some salt into the wound, you can hear Metatron laughing at you every time he goes for Fire of Sinai. The only way to survive during this phase is to keep Metatron debuffed and use Rakukaja to keep your defense at plus 4. Oh no! The most terrifying move outside of Debilitate is the Kaja. Usually, as long as he is debuffed, he will prioritize using the Kunda, but there is still a chance that he goes for a random Dekaja out of nowhere. If Metatron goes for Dekaja, I have to somehow survive long enough to rebuff myself in the hardest phase of the fight where Metatron can use Fire of Sinai to easily destroy me. I have attempted this fight so many times, with each attempt lasting between 35 and 50 minutes, only for Metatron to put me in a terrible situation because he used the Kaja and kept using the Kunda over and over to prevent my debuff from doing anything meaningful. And what makes this even more annoying is that there is no shortcut leading back to the boss. The only save point in the labyrinth is right at the very start of the dungeon, so every time I lose, I have to go through the entire 5th Kalpa again just to have a shot at fighting this guy. You know that moment in a Souls game where you get killed by your boss and then you have to run through the entire area just to attempt the fight again? Yeah, we have that in this game too. After dying again, I decided to grind to go from level 87 to 99. Once it was done, I bought the last Magatama I was missing. I then tried to fight again and while the HP increase was indeed useful, I was still getting filtered by the third phase. With each loss I had to go through, I could feel a part of me dying little by little. But despite all of this, I kept going. In the face of adversity, I was still clinging to hope. Lord, grant me the strength to vanquish this spirit of evil! Yeah, I'm healing now. Good. Oh my god, he's always getting the double hits. It's a good thing I'm buffed right now. Would be really bad if I wasn't. And as soon as I talk about buffing, he, like clockwork, he goes for the Kaja. This is insane. Look at the amount of damage he's dealing. Why? What? And he got a what? He got a crit. Oh my god. Oh, low HP stance. God have mercy. Is he killing me now? Oh my god, he almost killed me. Mm, that's a bit... No, that's too much. Yeah, I have to go back to while crying. He's getting too comfortable. He's spamming the Kaja again! Ah, how many times? Has it, it's been like three or four times. Stop! Stop! Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Mm, oh. Kill him! No! Yes! 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 <laughs> yes! Yes! He was about to kill me with a crit. Oh my god! <laughs> oh! <laughs> As you can tell, I felt really good when I won this fight. However, uh, I do have a confession to make. This wasn't my first win against this boss. On my 7th attempt, the fight lasted so long that Metatron eventually ran out of MP, and this allowed me to win the fight. Yeah, unlike the newer entries in the series, bosses in this game don't have infinite MP. I could have kept going after that win, but I wasn't satisfied with what happened. 
You see, what annoyed me wasn't the fact that Metatron ran out of MP. It was the fact that I wasn't planning to drain his MP, but he still ran out anyway. It didn't feel like I earned the win. To me, it felt like I essentially got bailed out. So instead of continuing with the story, I spent 13 additional hours fighting Metatron to beat him before he would run out of MP. <laughs> I think now you understand why I call myself a masochist. I am Metatron. I am one with God. Feel the wrath of God. Where, Where is your God? God? Where, Where is your God, God now? now? After defeating the voice of God, I can go past the boss arena and take the elevator to meet the lady in black as well as Lucy at the very bottom of the labyrinth. As a reward for making it this far, Lucy unlocks my full potential. We are now officially locked in the true demon ending. After the cutscene, I find myself back in the Shinjuku Medical Center, the same place where my journey started. And if you check Marugaref, you can see that what used to be a question mark has been replaced with Pierce. Pierce allows your physical attack to ignore all resistances except for repel, so now my attacks can deal full damage against foe with resist, null, and absorb physical. It's a really good skill, but it's too early to learn it yet. I will do that when the time is right. In front of me lies the Tower of Kagutsushi, the final dungeon. It will be painful, it will be difficult, but the struggle must go on. With my determination fully rejuvenated, I entered inside the tower and sealed my fate. Amuse me with your strength, evil one, before eternal silence is upon us. If you do not heed my words, then I shall send you to hell. This is but a game. In the first phase, Ariman will start every turn by forbidding a specific action. Physical attacks are forbidden. If you use the forbidden action, Ariman will immediately counter with Hell's Call, which is a guaranteed one-shot, so you really need to play along with this game. Ariman always starts the fight by forbidding physical attacks, and the action he forbids won't change until he takes damage. This means that I can fully debuff him with Warcry and Fog Breath, and then stack 4 Hakukajas to max out my defense. As the fight goes on, the amount of actions Ariman forbids will increase, but as long as you have your buffs and debuffs, surviving is manageable. <laughs> Let us continue. Liking this video is forbidden. Okay, that was weird. And eventually, after dealing enough damage, you will move to the next stage of the fight. We are now in phase 2. Ariman gets access to a bunch of powerful attacks like Megidoleon, but the one you really need to watch out for is Apocalypse. It's a scary move, but as long as I can keep my buffs and debuffs, I should be fine. Oh. Uh. Uh oh. Oh my god. <laughs> uh oh, right. Ariman has both Dekaja and Dekunda. If you get unlucky, this can become a big issue, but most of the time, he actually won't use these moves. In my next attempt, he never went for them, and that allowed me to focus on dealing a ton of damage with Iron Claw Gaming. And shortly after, I managed to silence Ariman. One boss down, two more to go. The next boss on the list is Noah, but he isn't actually blocking the path. So instead of going through the door, we can just skip him and take this elevator to reach floor 402, which has a safe terminal and a shop. And look, the mannequins are here! I really love this place. It's like a mini version of Asakusa in a way. In this junk shop, our good old buddy the smiling mannequin is here, and this time, he has the last Magatama I am missing, Kailash. Now, I would love to buy it, but as you can see, I am still broke. I had to find a way to make a lot of maca fast, and after doing some digging online, I found something very interesting and it involves going back to the Kalpas. So in the fourth Kalpa, there's a tunnel that's actually really good for money farming. If you break specific balls, you can get purple coins. The more purple coins you obtain, the more maca you will get at the end. 
When I first started doing this, it went pretty bad. I kept getting hit, losing coins, and by the end, I was getting pretty much nothing in terms of maca. But as I kept doing this, things changed. With each new run, I was getting better. I learned how to punch preemptively to break the off-screen balls, I learned where every purple coin was hidden, and I also learned how to move optimally to avoid the obstacles. As I kept getting better, I started earning more and more maca. I went from the measly 200 to 5k, then 13k, then 28k, then 43k. After a couple of tries, I had enough maca to portrait Skylash, but uh, I couldn't just stop there. This was when I realized that I truly became addicted to this minigame. I was so invested and engrossed in what I was doing that eventually I got to the point where I had over 1 million maca. I fast traveled to the tower of Kagutsushi and finally purchased Skylash. After obtaining the 24 Magatamas, you can visit the Cathedral of Shadows and Mido will give you the Lord Sword. If you then go to the grave of Masakado, the Lord Sword will react and open the path to the hidden dungeon, the Bandu Shrine. In order to obtain the most powerful Magatama in the game, I need to go through the ultimate trial of the Bandu Shrine. The first one on the list is Jikoku. Jikoku only spams ice. If you equip a Magatama with null ice, you can't lose. Then comes Zuchu. Zuchu only spams elect. If you equip a Magatama with null elect, you can't lose. Our third foe is Kumoku. Kumoku spams force. If you equip a Magatama with null force, uh, um, never mind. Kumoku is the first challenging member of the Pillar Man. Unlike the two others, this boss actually has functioning brain cells and goes for physical attacks 90% of the time. For the first four turns of the fight, Kumoku will use Raku Kajra and Rakunda until he is fully buffed and you are fully debuffed. Knowing this, my top priority is clicking Warcry to fully debuff him and then decrease his accuracy with Fog Breath. Surviving is really tough, but if I manage to dodge some attacks, I can use Raku Kajra to undo Kumoku's debuffs. Once I managed to survive long enough to undo the debuffs and buff my defense, it went a lot better. I was finally able to attack and after 16 minutes of intense combat, Iron Claw Gaming won me the fight. And now we have to defeat the final member of the Pillar Man, Bishamon. When I fought him the first time, it was pretty easy, but apparently this time for round 2, it's a different story. I have heard that he is extremely challenging, but surely it can't be that bad, right? Here we go again. Ay, 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 ay. You know, I have seen my fair share of difficult bosses in this game, and I can confidently say that nothing, nothing I fought up until now comes close to how dangerous, terrifying, and savage Bishamon actually is. And you can already tell that I'm going to have a bad time because unlike his three other friends, Bishamon always attacks first. The fact that Bishamon can hit you before you even get a chance to move makes this rematch insanely difficult. This absolute monster can open the fight in four different ways. Dragon Eye into four Tarukaja in a row and a physical attack. Dragon Eye into four Makakaja in a row and Megiddo Leon. A fire attack. Or my favorite, the double debilitate. If he opens with the Tarukaja combo, you will die. If he goes for the Makakaja combo, you will also die. The only chance you have to survive is if he goes for a fire attack or debilitate. You would think that having a weakness would make Bishamon a lot easier, but as the famous Chinese military general Sun Tzu said, fear the boss who has a weakness in a game where most have none. Bishamon has 10 billion ways to destroy me, but what truly really makes him difficult is how quickly he's able to buff himself. With Dragon Eye, his total action count goes up to 5. Because of this, in just one turn he's able to fully buff his attack or magic and then hit you. The only option I have to deal with this is War Cry. That skill is great because it allows me to debuff both his physical and magic attacks, but in this specific fight, it has one flaw. I can only debuff his stat by minus two. Bishamon is always going to buff himself faster than I can debuff him, and this leads to the next issue. As soon as he gets to plus three or plus four, he will stop buffing and focus on attacking. This isn't too bad if he goes for fire attacks because I have fire drain to absorb those. However, if Bishamon starts spamming physical attacks while buffed, you have no chance to survive. One of his most dangerous moves is actually his basic attack. Not only does it hit really hard, but it also has the unique property of never missing. Even with Fog Breath and Tsukukaja, it will always hit me. If he decides to spam the basic attack, there is simply nothing you can do about it. After losing 49 times in a row, 
I stopped fighting and went back to the drawing board. One thing that became pretty clear to me is that in order to increase my chances of winning, I would need to level up a lot more. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, but you are already at level 99, so how is this going to work? Well, you see, in Nocturne, 99 isn't the max level. The real maximum is 255. The game doesn't display levels beyond 99, but it's still possible to level up. This is very important because it means that I can keep leveling up to raise my HP stat. I went back to the Tower of Disco and spent hours grinding there. This process was very slow and challenging, but after 34 hours, I had finally managed to reach level 120. It's also around that time that I was discussing with King, a challenge runner who is very familiar with the hardcore TDE challenge. And he told me something very useful about this fight. If you equip a Magatama with a weakness and you also have a skill to drain that exact weakness, you will gain more HP from the drain. Thanks to King, I learned how to improve my build. With everything taken care of, I went back to the Bandu Shrine and fought Bishaman. The fight was still difficult and I kept losing because of the opener RNG, but this time it felt a lot better. Eventually, I got an attempt where he opened with debilitated twice. It's not the best opener, but at least I didn't take any damage. Thanks to Fog Breath, I was able to negate the accuracy penalty of debilitate. After making sure that Bishaman's physical attack was lowered enough by Warcry, I started going for Rakukaja with my second action. Unlike the newer entries in the series, Nocturne doesn't show you how many buffs or debuffs are currently active. This makes the fight extremely demanding because I have to keep track of that myself. I always need to know how many buffs or debuffs the shaman has and I also need to do the same thing for my own defense. There were many close calls and I really believed that I was done for. But even in the face of impending doom, I never lost hope and kept the struggle going. I have to hope he heals me there. Because otherwise I'm pretty much done. Nope. Of course it's Megidoleon, of course. Come on, do a fire attack. Come on. There you go. Oh, yes! Oh, I did it! Oh, thank God! By the way, if it felt like I sounded weird in this clip, it's because I was sick. It was around that period that I got COVID for the first time. And to this day, I really don't know how I got it. It's, it's weird. You got Kuhulan, who will use Makaja Mahan to steal you, and then there is Giri Mekala, who tries to give you COVID. With Bishamon defeated, I was able to enter inside the shrine to meet Taira no Masakado, and as a reward for coming this far, he gave me the best Magatama in the entire game, Masakado's. This amazing Magatama nullifies everything except almighty attacks. After reaching level 121, I replaced Fire Drain with one of the coolest unique spells for Demi Fiend, Magma Axis. I didn't imagine that we would meet here. Do you remember me? I remember you. I am Thor. Our paths have not crossed since the fall of the mantra. It seems that you and I have different objectives in climbing this tower. As a follower of Yosuga, I must annihilate you. The world of Yosuga shall be built upon your lifeless body. Prepare to meet your death! Ah, uh, it took a while, but I have finally reached my favorite part of any SMT game. The part where you get to reject your friends. It's time to defeat Isamu and his god Noah for good. You're on fire, Lance! Um, no, not, not that Noah. Okay, so um, I completely forgot that Noah's basic attack was almighty and their damage damage. To ensure my survival, I immediately went for War Cry twice in a row. Once that was done, I was able to heal myself and buff my defense. And after 11 minutes, I managed to move to the next phase. Huh? Ah! Oh, you look disgusting. <laughs> I like how even in this form, he still keeps the hat. Noah can use Aurora and this move has many effects. It allows Noah to repel physical attacks, and it also heavily decreases the damage of Almighty moves. On top of that, 
Aurora also allows Noah to repel every element except for one. So in order to deal damage, you have to keep track of what the weakness is. Oh, and by the way, when I say weakness, it's not a weakness in the traditional sense. It just means that whenever it goes for Aurora, there is one element that it doesn't repel, so you won't get any press turn from attacking. If you have Pierce and Fry Kugel, you can completely avoid having to deal with Aurora. I thought about doing that, but I didn't want to learn these skills this early. Unfortunately, this means that I have to actually engage with the gimmick. And it gets even worse when Noah starts using Domination. Domination is a powerful or mighty attack which drains your HP and MP. Even with buffs and debuffs, this attack drains a sizable amount of HP. Aurora limits my ability to deal damage, so if Noah spams this move too many times, eventually he will start out healing my damage. This fight took forever, but thankfully my magic spells allowed me to out damage Noah's domination, and after 35 minutes, I took him down with a powerful magma axis. Hey, finally! That's what you deserve, Isamu. Disgusting friend. Get out of here, bruh. Isamu got the ass whooping he deserved, and I obtained the Nether Stone. Oh, by the way, I like how the Magatsui leaving Noah's body makes it look like Isamu is crying right now. <laughs> After getting confused by the many invisible teleporters on the way, I finally reached my target. The last person on my list of friends soon to be rejected. Shiaki. You have done well to make it here. Therefore, I will do you the honor of fighting to my fullest ability. Our friendship dies here. Oh, don't worry. That's not the only thing that's dying here today. Ball of Atara has a unique move that turns you into a fly, but sadly for her, Master Kados protects me from that. The only thing she can hit me with is Megiddo Leon, so I can use the many free turns I get to focus on the offense. Once you deal enough damage, she will summon her two goons, Floros and Oze Alel. They will then fully heal her and that pretty much resets the fight. Floros is here to buff while Oze debuffs you. These guys are really annoying, so it's best to take them out first before focusing on Baal. It took me a while, but thanks to Iron Claw Gaming, I was able to take out Floros. As for Oze, he goes for Dekunda a bit too much and that made landing Iron Claw Gaming difficult, so I had to resort to slide punching him in the face until I was able to send him back to Deviant Art. With the two furries gone, the fight became a lot easier. I made sure to debuff Baal, use focus to boost my attacks, and Iron Claw Gaming took care of the rest. One more friend rejected. Why? Why won't you accept Yosuga when you possess such strength? This is payback for what you did to Futomimi, idiot. At last, the mannequins of Asakusa and their leader Futomimi have been avenged. I do not know where mannequins go after their death, but I pray that the afterlife will be kinder to them. In the face of adversity and insurmountable odds, you never give up on your dream to create a world where everyone would be equal. You were used, abused, and belittled by others. But in spite of this, you pushed on and kept struggling. Many of the mannequins died at Minfunashiro, but not all of them did. These mannequins that the world deemed weak still managed to climb the tower of Kagutsushi, determined to continue what Futomimi started. Your lives may have ended, but your legacy will never die. May you rest in peace, you beautiful twitchy bros. It's time to prepare for the final battle. Soon enough, I reached level 127 and learned the passive skill Pierce. Then I learned Avenge at level 128. Now there is only one thing left for me to do. Offering the three stones I have obtained during my ascent and ride the elevator up to the final boss. I shall never forgive you for causing the death of the world. My light, searing with anger, shall wipe you from existence.
yep, that's right, the final boss's theme sounds like something you would hear in a club. And honestly, considering the fact that this is a giant disco ball, <laughs> it's kinda fitting. This fight is pretty unique in the sense that it fully implements the mechanic of the moon phases. At the end of each turn, the phase will advance by two stages, going from new to two, to four, to six, to full, and the same thing backwards from full to new. How much damage you deal to Kagutsushi is tied to the phases. The brighter it is, the less damage you will deal. It also works the other way around, meaning that the darker it is, the more damage it will take. For that reason, it's very important to make sure you hit Kagutsushi when the phase is at new for maximum damage. Whenever the phase is full, Kagutsushi gets to use Vast Light, a really powerful or mighty attack. There is no way to dodge this move, so the best way to deal with it is to use the most important mechanic that Nocturne taught us. Buffs and debuffs. As long as you keep this boss debuffed and attack at the right time, you will be able to deal enough damage to proceed to the next phase. Time for phase 2. From that point onward, the moon cycle will remain full until the very end of the fight. Kagutsuchi also gets to use a more powerful version of Vast Light called Infinite Light. This attack almost removes half of my HP while Kagutsuchi is fully debuffed and I'm fully buffed. It's very dangerous, but fortunately for us, it has a tail. Before using Infinite Light, Kagusuchi will always spout some random BS and end its turn, so you will know exactly when you need to heal. As long as it goes for elemental spells, I have nothing to worry about, but I still have to watch out because of Kagusuchi's basic attack. Kagusuchi's basic attack is the most dangerous thing in this fight because it deals a lot of damage and it has the ability to crit. I am destiny. Shut up. I don't care. I don't care what you are. I'm here to punch you in the face. Ah, it's almost time. <laughs> Look at the wind shaking. <laughs> if you manage to keep up the offense, eventually Kagutsuchi will start shaking like crazy. This is an indicator that the end is near, but you still have to watch out because from the very moment it starts shaking, Kagutsuchi will use infinite light a lot more often than before. It was a long journey, but everything must come to an end. I use focus to buff my attack, thanks to the powerful infinite light, and with my boosted Iron Claw Gaming, I was able to get rid of the Disco Ball on my first try. And there you have it folks! The final boss has been defeated. Thank you for watching and I will see you in another video. Oh! Oh hey look it's Lucy! Yo Lucy! I did exactly what you wanted man! The Disco Ball is gone so um... <laughs> uh, can I go home now? Lu Lucy? Creation is no longer possible. L Lucy? What, what, what is happening? A world is created. Why, why do I hear boss music? First, I must know the extent of the power of darkness you hold within. Behold. The supreme power of darkness, created by none other than the Great Will himself. Yeah, I'm done. He's gonna kill me. Oh my god, the basic attack spam! Why is he so good at doing this? Oh shit! Here we go again. I'm sure many of you were waiting for this exact moment. Yup, in the True Demon ending, Kagusuchi isn't the last boss. Immediately after beating it, you are forced to fight the true final boss of Nocturne. I really like the vibe of this fight. The Kagusuchi phase we have seen for the entirety of the game says dead, to illustrate what we have done. We are surrounded by the void and countless celestial bodies shining brightly in the background. The world has ended. Time has ended. It's just you and your gigantic foe, the Lord of Chaos himself. 
this fight is also the hardest battle in the entire game. Oh my god, and my suffering, I want to die. Lucifer has 65,545 HP and MP. No other boss ever comes close to those numbers. He also resists every damage type by 75%, and yes, this does include Almighty. Pierce lets you go through these resistances, and that's why it's mandatory to have that skill for this fight. Lucy has three distinct phases, and each of these is tied to a specific HP threshold. In phase 1, he has four attacks that you can go for. Evil Gleam, which is a mind attack capable of charming you, Mabufudine, Megidola, and his basic attack. Evil Gleam and Mabufudan get blocked by Masakado's immunities, so they aren't really threatening. What is threatening, though, is Lucy's basic attack. For whatever reason, it counts as almighty, meaning that you cannot block it. It's impossible to dodge, and on top of that, it also has an insanely high crit chance. And when I say insanely high, it's to the point where you are more likely to see the crit than not critting at all. Uh, what is up with this game and basic attacks? Without boss and debuffs, it's simply not possible to survive, so my number one priority in this phase is to debuff Lucy's attack and fully buff myself with Rakukaja as fast as I can. The love tap is insane, but at least it can proc Avenge, meaning that I have a chance to use my counter. After applying Fog Breath twice, I can finally start using Focus and Iron Claw Gaming to deal damage. Once Lucifer's HP drops to 75%, we go into phase 2, and this is where the real fight truly begins. Lucifer gets to use one of his most dangerous unique attacks, High King. This stupid move is one of the hardest hitting attacks in the entire game. Oh, by the way, High King also never misses, so dodge strats are pretty much useless against this boss. It's a really oppressive attack, but as long as I have buffs and debuffs, I should be able to lay. Uh oh, uh, ooh, ooh, you can just dekaja like that? No! Ah! Stop the catching! What? Huh? Yeah, um, in phase 2, Lucifer also gets access to both the Kaja and the Kunda. And this is a big problem. Once you reach phase 2, it becomes almost impossible to attack, so you have to rely on Avenge to deal damage for you. It sounds good on paper, but this strat can only work if you manage to keep Lucifer debuffed while your defense has been boosted by Raku Kaja. And uh, that's something I simply cannot do. I would love to tell you what happened in the third phase, but I can't. Why? Because I'm always getting casual filtered in the second phase. No matter what I did, all my attempts ended in the same way. As soon as I got to the phase shift, Lucifer went for Dekaja and Dekunda until he could just click the skill issue button to finish me off. This was clearly not going to work. Oh, and here is a little fun fact for you. There are no checkpoints between Kagutsushi and Lucy, so whenever you die here, you always have to go through the Kagutsushi fight again. Awesome! Attempting this fight at level 128 clearly didn't work, so I decided to grind some more. You see, in Nocturne, a lot of physical skills scale with your level, so the more I level up, the more damage I should be able to deal. I went back to the Tower of Disco and spent what felt like an eternity grinding until I reached level 150. Surely, now that I am stronger, the fight should be easy. <laughs> Yeah, even at 150, nothing changed. I then spent even more hours grinding from 150 to 180. Thanks to the level ups, my damage did improve, and that was great, but unfortunately, it didn't change the outcome of the fight. Dealing damage was never the reason I kept dying. It was because Lucifer was allowed to use the Kaja and the Kunda. After losing to Lucifer once again, I slowly came to the realization that completing this challenge might not be possible. The situation was looking grim, but there was still one strategy that I could go for. A strategy that only the most determined, the most insane would ever consider. Draining Lucifer of all of his MP. In Nocturne, bosses don't have infinite MP, meaning that they can run out of it. And if they run out of MP, they can't use spells anymore. So in theory, if I were to make Lucifer run out of MP, he shouldn't be able to use the Kaja and the Kunda anymore, and this will take care of the most troublesome part of the fight. Also, to make the process go faster, I could equip the Anathema Magatama to learn Mana Drain, an almighty skill which allows me to drain MP. This sounds good on paper, but in practice, it is extremely painful. The reason why I said that only the most insane would ever consider doing this is because fully draining Lucifer of all of his MP in a solo run would take a ridiculous amount of time. Lucifer has 65,535 MP. To give you an idea of how insane that is, 
Kagutsuchi, which is normally the final boss of the game, has a total of 17,000 MP. That is just 26% of Lucifer's total MP pool. And you also have to remember that Lucy has a 75% resistance to everything including Almighty. Pierce only works on physical skills, so my mana drain is going to steal even less MP than normal. After coming up to that conclusion, I thought long and hard about what my next move should be. Draining Lucy wasn't going to be a pleasant experience, but it was the only shot I had. So I reloaded my save, replaced Avenge with Mana Drain, and after stealing my resolve, I defeated Kagutsuchi and faced Lucifer once again. It was finally time to see how much MP Mana Drain could steal. Alright. <laughs> 11! Oh, 11 MP. Oh, oh god, this is going to take forever. This doesn't look good at all, but there is a silver lining. Lucifer's phases are tied to how much HP he has, so as long as I don't deal damage, I can dream in phase 1 where his moveset is a lot more manageable. This is exactly why I removed Avenge, to make sure that I wouldn't be dealing any damage. Unfortunately, draining Lucifer isn't that simple. You can't just put the game on auto while going on YouTube and watching a 7 hour long retrospective video on the Castlevania series. Lucy can easily kill me with his basic attack spam, so I must be paying attention at all time to make sure that I heal myself when my HP gets too low. Also, using Mana Drain made me realize that whenever you hit Lucy, um, he does this thing with his eyebrows. You know, the... I made sure to heal myself whenever needed, and I kept using Mana Drain on Lucifer with the intent of fully draining him. I'm not sure if I can properly convey to you how exhausting this was. I did this for 2 hours, then 4 hours. Then 6 hours. Eventually, I lost track of how much time had passed. I had been going for so long and Lucy was still able to use spells. That's when I started getting consumed by my doubts. Maybe I was mistaken. Maybe draining this boss was truly a futile endeavor. But even if this was true, I was in too deep to give up just yet, so I kept going and eventually... When I saw this for the first time, I couldn't believe it. After spending so many hours clicking Mana Drain, I finally managed to suck all of Lucy's MP. This is it. The time has come to make Lucifer pay for all the suffering and wait. I, I don't have any healing items left anymore. <sighs> I still died. I ran out of healing items and at that point, I was powerless. If you are wondering how long this took, the full recording of this attempt is 11 hours. I am not kidding or being dramatic here. It took me 11 hours to achieve this. To put this into perspective, on speedrun.com, the fastest hard true demon ending speedrun is also 11 hours. Let that sink in for a moment. In the time it took me to fully drain Lucy, someone was able to beat the entire game on hard mode. I, I don't know how to feel about this, but uh, <laughs> I had to share this info with you. Despite my best efforts, I was once again greeted by the cold embrace of failure. But something was different. I was expecting to be filled with despair, but instead, I was hopeful. I was hopeful because for the first time ever since I started fighting this boss, I finally managed to see the sentence insufficient MP. Draining Lucifer was possible, and if it was possible, it meant that victory could be achieved. After confirming that the strategy could work, there were two things left for me to do reaching the maximum level of 255 and tweaking my skills. Going from 180 to 255 means that I have to gain 75 levels. And with each level up, the experience needed keeps increasing higher and higher. Gaining 52 levels took me around 50 hours and after doing it, I really didn't feel like spending even more time on what's easily the most boring and tedious part of the run. So I decided to cut myself some slack and I purchased the Mitama DLC to speed things up. After purchasing the DLC, I went to the place where the Demi-Fiend was born and kept killing Mitamas until I obtained enough Grimoires to level up. Thanks to these items, it took me an hour to reach level 255. If I was still grinding in that tower, this would have taken me over 75 hours easily. While I was leveling up, I used that opportunity to update my moveset. Unfortunately, this is the end of the road for my beloved Iron Claw Gaming. This skill saved me time and time again, but in this fight, it's simply not ideal. The fact that it requires fog breath to function makes it really unreliable, so I decided to replace it with something else. Frykugel Gaming, one of the strongest attacks Demifin can learn. Removing Iron Claw meant that I also had to ditch fog breath. I was discussing with Zephyr, another fellow challenge runner, and he proposed a skill that I hadn't considered up until now. 
The Arahan fully heals you and it only costs 15 MP. This spell is extremely cheap and if you pair it with Mana Drain, it means that I should never have to worry about running out of healing ever again. With my preparation completed, I went back to the Tower of Disco, destroyed Kagutsuchi and braced myself for the upcoming marathon ahead of me. Once I finished setting up, I went for the Mana Drain strat and this time I could definitely see the difference. With the combination of the Arahan and Mana Drain, I was able to sustain myself without using any sort of healing item. On top of that, I also found out about a very useful setting in the option menu. You see, there is an option called Auto Memory and it allows you to repeat your last action when pressing the Auto button in battle. So after going for Mana Drain, I can press that button and the game will automatically use Mana Drain for me. I don't have to go through menus anymore so I can keep the game on Auto while Lucy isn't doing anything threatening and then turn it off when my HP goes below a certain threshold. This kept going for a while and after passing the 7 hour mark, Lucifer was finally out of all of his MP. There was no time to waste. I went for focus and unleashed as many Fry Kugel as I could and eventually I made it to the second phase. Lucifer tried to spam the Kaja and the Kunda but this time it didn't work. Without any MP to use them, these two spells went from being a death sentence to wasting Lucifer's press turns. After making sure that I was fully healed, I kept going for Fry Kugel relentlessly. Ah, oh, it's not a crit, dang it. Oh no, Root of Evil. Oh, please, don't do something dumb. Please, 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 please. Ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, yes. Screw it. Fry Kugel! Oh, don't, don't kill me. Oh. Oh my god. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh! He didn't crit! Yo! Jesus Christ, Hiking is still dealing so much damage. He can kill me at any time. Oh no. Stop! No! 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 Oh, oh, I spent so many hours doing this and he still killed me with the root of evil. I spent so many hours working on this challenge, let alone this fight. And, and I have nothing left. I have nothing to show for it. In this attempt, it took me 8 hours to fully drain Lucifer. This was definitely an improvement since I managed to shave off 3 hours. However, 8 hours was still a really long amount of time to be spending on a boss fight. Once you drop Lucifer's HP to 50%, he will enter in his third phase. This is when he gets access to the most terrifying attack I have ever seen in this series, Root of Evil. It also has one of the most raw skill descriptions I've ever seen in a video game. Lucifer summoned darkness and broke your Nintendo DS. The effect of Root of Evil is randomly chosen from a list of 6 possible outcomes. It has a 40% chance to reduce your HP by 50%, a 20% chance to reduce it by 75%, a 10% chance to reduce it by 90%, and it also has a chance to inflict Mute, Poison or Stun, with each of these 3 effects having a 10% chance to happen. So every time Lucifer goes for Root of Evil, the attack will pick one effect out of this list. The 3 status effects are the least threatening ones because Masakado's protects me from them. If Root of Evil picks a status effect while you have Masakado equipped, it will say miss. The thing is, the odds of seeing these results are extremely low. Most of the time, Root of Evil will deal damage to you, making it extremely easy for Lucifer to finish you off at any time. Root of Evil turns Nocturne into a gacha game where Lucifer is the main protagonist and he gets to pull as many times as he wants without ever spending money. Once he pulls out the Root of Gacha, you have to end the fight as fast as you can, because the longer it goes on, the more likely it is that you will die. But wait, it actually gets even worse. Something that I didn't know when I started this run is that the version of Nocturne you pick at the start of the game actually affects the difficulty of the Lucifer fight. If you pick the Chronicle version with Raido, Lucifer has two new tricks up his sleeve. The first one is the Arahan. 
Once Lucy loses over 40k HP, he will go for the Arahan to fully heal himself. Thankfully, I will always make sure to fully drain him before we get there, so this shouldn't happen. What is really problematic, however, is the second tweak Lucifer received. In the Chronicle version, Root of Evil has a guaranteed chance to remove every buff you have. As soon as he starts using this move, I lose my plus 4 defense and this makes it extremely difficult to survive the third phase. These two tweaks are only present in the Chronicle version of the game. If you pick Maniacs, you will never have to deal with them. Remember that choice I made at the very start of the run when I picked Chronicle instead of Maniacs? Yup, unbeknownst to me, this single choice ended up making this run even harder. And what makes this worse is that once you reach phase 3, Lucifer will actively spam Root of Evil every other turn. This attack frequency makes it pointless to try rebuffing my defense. Lucy will still remain at minus 4 attack, but without my plus 4 defense, I have a high chance to die. Now, some of you might be wondering, how is this boss still able to use some moves despite the fact that he has 0 MP? Well, that's because all of Lucifer's unique moves do not cost any MP whatsoever. So draining his MP doesn't even mean that I am guaranteed to win. It is very useful, yes, but it won't protect me from all of Lucy's most dangerous attacks. No. No, 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 no. Ah, dang. No, no, no. Ah, no, no, no. What makes losing to Lucifer so soul crushing isn't just root of evil. It's the fact that I have to spend at the very least 8 hours to stand a chance and even after spending so many hours, all it takes is one unlucky root of evil to delete any progress I made. It's after losing once again that I realized something. Even at level 255, I wasn't dealing enough damage to end the fight before Lucy would end me. In my lack of foresight, I got rid of the two best ways to increase my damage potential, Rakunda and Tarukaja. Because of Root of Evil's built-in Dekaja effect, not having Tarukaja isn't that big of a deal. But for Rakunda, it's a real problem because Lucifer has no way to remove debuffs once he runs out of MP. When I came to that realization, at that exact moment, I was reminded of what King told me earlier during the run. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but after some bouts against Lucy at 255, I thought about things and how the fight would look like in Chronicle. And I believe, unless you intend to mana drain Lucy, that you are better off restarting your entire playthrough right now to get Rakunda. I don't mean that in a you will never beat Lucifer way. I mean that in a if you gave your save to a friend who did everything you would do, they played on with your save and you restarted now and got Rakunda, you would catch up to them while they are stuck at Lucifer and then beat him before they would beat him kind of way. I really hope that this wouldn't happen, but after everything I've seen so far, even with Mana Drain, it became pretty clear to me that King was right. I was at the crossroad with two possible paths. I could go right and keep fighting Lucifer on the save file until I won. This would allow me to retain my progress, but because of the lack of Rakunda, it would significantly increase the amount of hours needed to even have a shot at defeating Lucifer. Or I could go left, replay through the game and make sure to keep Rakunda. Having Rakunda would allow me to deal twice as much damage, but to achieve that, I would have to give up on all the progress I had made. Both paths had their pros and cons, and it wasn't an easy decision to make, but after thinking about it for a while, I decided to restart the game. At first, I thought that I would have to replay through the game from the very beginning, but fortunately for me, I didn't need to do that. You see, since I knew that this run would be very difficult, I had the foresight of keeping backup saves at various parts of the run. The exact moment I lost Rakunda during the run was after beating Daisoju and reaching Asakusa. I made a backup right before doing that, so I was able to reload that save and start from there. This was going to save me some time, but the process of replaying through the game again would still take forever. This is why I decided that for the second run, I was going to play on Merciful difficulty up until I reached Lucifer, and then I would switch the difficulty back to hard. Merciful difficulty doubles your damage, and thanks to that, I was able to quickly progress through the game while destroying every boss standing in my way. Replaying through the game meant that I had to collect all the Magatamas all over again, and unfortunately, this also meant that I had to go through the stupid Puzzle Boy minigame. AGAIN! I had to solve this goofy ass puzzle BS not just once, but twice. After that, I got the Lord's Sword, survived the trials of the Bendu Shrine, and obtained Masakados. I climbed the Tower of Kagutsushi, dunked on Vegeta, rejected my friends one more time, and after 30 hours, I had finally reached the very end of the game. I didn't spend hours grinding from grimoires and leveling up until I managed to reach level 255. 
This went relatively fast, but the worst was yet to come. In order to fit Rakunda into my build, I have to remove one of my 8 skills, and the only one I can afford to remove is the Arahan. Removing the Arahan means that I have to rely on healing items again. This meant that I had to spend countless hours abusing lucky tickets. It took forever, but at last, it had been done. I switched the difficulty back to hard, dealt a ton of damage to Gagutsushi until the disco ball fell, and I was once again facing the fallen angel Lucifer. Immediately at the start of the fight, I wasted no time and debuffed Lucifer with Warcry while taking the time to heal myself and buff my defense. Then, once the openings presented themselves, I went for Rakunda four times to ensure that Lucifer's defense was at its lowest. And at that exact moment, I learned something really interesting. On top of increasing the damage of my physical attacks, Rakunda also allows me to drain more MP. The skill went from draining 11 to 24 MP with each mana drain, which is fantastic. Discovering this filled me with determination and gave me the strength needed to endure this grueling process. Many hours passed, but without ever faltering, I kept going for mana drain with the intent of seeing this through to the end. It went on for 2 hours, 3 hours, 4 hours, 5 hours, and at the 6 hour mark, the deed was done. Lucifer was drained of all of his MP, and this time I had Rakunda. After spending 6 hours playing defensively, it was time to go on the offense. Are we in phase 3? Yep, we are in phase 3. Oh my god. Okay, that's fine. Are you gonna use the arrow hand, please? He's gonna kill me. Oh, thank God. He, he cannot... I don't think he can use Root of Evil back to back, so I should be fine here. Yes! Okay, I'm almost there. He's gonna have Root of Evil this turn. Yep. Please, 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 for the love of God, please, please! Ah, oh, I have 50%. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, he's proccing my... <sighs> well, I survived because of Ender. I have no other safety net now. Uh... Look at the damage. Is, how close is he from death right now? I don't know. Oh, okay, that's... Oh! Oh, that's amazing. Come on, crit, crit him, kill him! Kill him now, please! Please! Oh, I don't know if he dies here. Oh, this is so bad. Does he die here? I don't know. I don't know if he dies. Oh, this is so scary. Oh, I should have been counting the damage. Yep. This is the most important turn of the fight. Yes! Miss! Yes! Yes! Kill him, Vimy Finn! Kill him! Yes! 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 I did it! I did it! Oh, yeah. 
Well, there you have it. And my reward for going through this was nothing. But you know, in the end, maybe the real Shin Megami Tensei was the friends we rejected along the way. I have made a playlist with all the main boss fights and you can check it in the description below. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's time for me to play the Future Redeem DLC for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Hmm? Why is that icon over- Oh, 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 oh,